Hello, good morning. Good morning to our one remote participant. I hope the I hope we are well heard even over there. Uh, so I was uh, kindly invited to uh, give a lecture or series of lectures on quantum computing for us observations uh, during this call. And because it is quite a large topic, quantum computing, so I ask all our caveats to be my support here. We used to do, uh, work together at the Institute of Third Column Applied Informatics. That's the left logo on the screen. Uh, but I moved to a new unit, uh, Nikolaus Kopernikus Astronomical Center of Polish Academy of Sciences, and to particularly to a unit called Astro Center, which I kind of represent, where I also do quantum computing amongst other, other things. Uh, so we are supported by Foundation for Polish Science and through European fund, for Union's uh, grants, uh, a part of what we are supported here for kindly by the organizers. But the research we do is uh, supported by European Union nowadays. Uh, so I will start, uh, that's the agenda of the uh, subsequent uh, subsequent uh, lectures. There are five of, of them uh, in the sense, so we divided the, the entire material into five, uh, five uh, different uh, blocks. First, I will start with some introduction, uh, then uh, I will pass the, the floor to Ola and Ola will talk about the, all the basics, mathematical basics of quantum computing. So to explain why I am quantum, quantum programmer for 20 years already, and Ola is a mathematician, computer scientist, doing her PhD in, in uh, quantum information theory. First of all, I want to set up some rules. I want this uh, meeting to be a conversation. Uh, because if uh, you are going just to listen to us, there is basically no uh, point. The material is relatively, maybe not difficult, but challenging in terms of notation. So there is a language barrier, mathematical language barrier, that we'll have to overcome in order to have proper understanding of what uh, we mean by particular uh, mathematical objects here. Okay, the, the beginning, so the first lecture is, is as follows. So we'll start about some introduction on, on quantum computing and then uh, the most important part with the second one, which is building blocks of quantum words. So this is the, the axioms of uh, quantum mechanics presented from a particular point of view, from the point of view of uh, quantum computing. Uh, during the second lecture, there will be more, we'll dive into more mathematical reasoning, uh, like, no, sorry, into more computer science point of view. So how to compute using these axioms of quantum mechanics and how to, in, how to, what are the basic tools of computation we have uh, in, the, in the quantum computing world? You will see an example that is completely useless, but pedagogical of Deutsch algorithm, uh, which is a very simple, just two qubit algorithm, which shows a couple of uh, features of quantum computing, which are very important, entanglement, superposition, and uh, oh, how to apply measurement. And we will show it, I mean, all I will show it in, 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 in gory detail, mathematical details, so you can follow step by step what's going on. This gory mathematical details is just linear algebra. There's nothing more to that. So it's really first year uh, course of uh, any engineering school. Then in this, this fourth section, we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the idea how to go from the algorithm down to the hardware. This hardware is abstract, it is just a toy example, but you will see how an algorithm can be connected to or can be transformed to a physical system, how it can be implemented on a physical system by, uh, by uh, basically subsequent steps of uh, stack of, uh, of uh, quantum computation. So that's something uh, that might be useful for you to really grasp why, how Schrodinger's equation is connected to quantum computing and to quantum algorithms. Then uh, there will be short, a short talk about, I mean, short part on noise devices, but it is, it is very 
it is a very deep area, so we are just going to scratch the surface, or not even scratch the surface, just pointed out the surface is there. Uh, then I will start to talk about quantum neural networks uh, and uh, how, what they mean. So basically, it is more. It will be there will be more computation. There will be Python there. There will be source code, visualization, and some fun stuff. Something that is you know hands on, and you can something that you can try to to implement yourself using uh, the tools that exist nowadays. Run it on simulators or actual devices if you have access to them. Then there will be uh, some, okay, so the, the, the fourth talk will be on, um, fourth lecture will be on adiabatic quantum computation, so quantum annealing, uh, and how, what it really means, why, why it is it interesting, and then I will show you one example uh, that uh, we've done uh, with a couple of people of using quantum annealer for land cover classification, so something closer to the area of this school, but it is maybe not very useful, but nevertheless interesting and uh, very pedagogical. So at the end, we have uh, I will show you the application of rational quantum agent solvers, uh, or so basically what quantum computing really means now. The 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 the, the algorithm that we use uh, today, and uh, we we used we can use it with existing quantum computers. And at the end of the talk, I will show you what are the applications for remote sensing. There will be there will be my results or my with my my colleagues and our collaborators, and there will be some uh, review of results you've already seen in the talk by uh, Bertrand Lusso. So summer in future, we might skip some of these uh, subjects if we find it's not very we don't have enough time, or we, we are to or you are not interested in them. Okay, so lecture one, introduction, why quantum computing? You've seen all, uh, already this, uh, this kind of picture. We have number of transistors uh, in uh, the circuits, classical circuits, our quantum uh, classical chips, and the time. So until 2020, we have exponential speed up of, uh, I mean, not speed up, exponential number of transistors being uh, put into uh, classical devices which is great, it is the Moore's law, and uh, it is one aspect of Moore's law. And our, so it seems that our classical computers are getting better and better, which is actually not completely true because our computers are not getting faster anymore. Why? Because with the clock speeds, the amount of energy dissipated by the uh, chips is rises very quickly, and we cannot go beyond uh, probably five, six uh, gigahertz. So we have to go. Uh, we have to go uh, further uh, down with the size of the chips. So the with particle of transistors have to be very small, but because then they dissipate less energy. And uh, what if we go down? then the problem is that our transistors are already so small that quantum effects are important in their functioning. So we cannot go even lower. Or if we go lower, we have to take quantum mechanics into account. This is a slide that uh, basically summarizes this, uh, what, what I've said uh, mm, in a way. Uh, which, uh, which you've probably seen already. So basically, there, there was a shift in 2005, basically, and uh, the computer could not go, could not be any faster anymore, basically. That's, that's a major issue, and it's already like, almost 20 years that we, we deal with that. So we have GPUs, we have massively massive parallel computing nowadays, but it is not very convenient because of the Amdahl's law. So what Amdahl's law says is that if you have a parallel program that has to do something in sequence, you are basically in a very bad place because this uh, amount of uh, work that you will do in, have to do in sequence has to be, uh, will impact your speed of computation, regardless of number of amount of resources you'll put into that basically asymptotically. So we are limited to that. 
by that and we have to look elsewhere. As I said, quantum, uh, quantum computing in a way is motivated by the fact that quantum effects are, um, are exist in the transistor or will be with impact transistors. But that's not the main mathematical point. The mathematics, five nanometers now, and basically oh, we are already there. So basically there are some problems. I mean, of course they work now, but if, I don't know, maybe two nanometers might not be, an, uh, might, be no, might be already a problem. They, there, there are some attempts with one nanometer transistors now, but we are at the edge and there is quantum tunneling, tunneling effects are there. I'm not uh, really into this uh, area. There are some new research, this ongoing research going on uh, constantly on this subject, but, uh, Mm, but it is already a problem, basically. But what I wanted to say, we are not working on quantum computing because we are going so low with the transistors. We are working on quantum computing because it is essentially a completely different idea. This is not classical computing by any means. It is not just classical computing done in a different way. It is a different paradigm of computing it is a different idea that, uh, and different mathematics that, uh, that describes this entire process. And you will learn this mathematics and this idea here. Yeah, so I'm giving the floor to Ola. And uh, if you have any questions, just ask them during the, the lecture. We have a conversation here. Do whatever you, 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 want. you want. I want you to learn about this, this subject. I mean, we want to learn this subject. Uh, thank you. So at the beginning, again, please, if there's something is unclear now, please say it as quickly as possible, because otherwise it will get worse and more difficult later on, because everything that will be during the first lecture will be extremely needed later on. Um, my approach will be more mathematical and more based on quantum information theory rather than practical. Uh, so there will be some examples like calculated directly and um, basically I will try to teach you some what is the language of quantum information theory and what are the basic notions like quantum states quantum measurements and quantum evolutions and channels and uh, well I hope after this lecture you'll know clearly what is quantum superposition and quantum entanglement um, well. so I have a question to the audience. Are you excited? <laughs> <laughs> have some fun. I mean, look at, uh, think about it, look at it and uh, have some fun. Sorry. Okay, so I will start with disappointing that quantum computer is not self-sufficient and won't be probably soon. Um, that it won't look like another computer, just better. To use the quantum computer, you will always need classical computer to control it and then when you get the results of quantum computing, you still need to measure the, measure the quantum system. And then again, you get the measurement results back into classical computer. So you need something to operate quantum computer. And uh, this is something that will be more about later. I will focus on the part about what's inside the quantum system. Okay, so let's focus now just on the quantum part. So here inside, you can think that what's inside quantum and the classical outside. So when we perform any computation, then we first need to prepare some input. So there's, there's a quantum state, whatever it means for now. Um, I will explain with what is this fancy uh, symbol for the preparation for the state parameters. And, but for now it's a state something quantum counterparts of bits. Then you, perform some evolution on this. So this is the actual computation. And later on, you measure the quantum system to get some classical information about the results. So measurement is the only way to get some classical knowledge about what is happening inside the quantum, quantum device, the quantum system. So 
sometimes we say that we don't actually see, we can't see what's inside the quantum device, but we only see the measurement results. And uh, now in the following half an hour, I will be explaining first what are quantum states. So what is the, in the first block on the left, then I will explain how to get the results, how to measure a quantum state, how to get some classical knowledge about quantum states. And um, the whole second lecture will be focused on quantum evolution. Um, we'll get to know why there is a letter U and what it means, a unitary gate. Um, so let's go to the first part of quantum states. Okay, in quantum, in normal informatics, we all know bits. This is something very simple. It can be either zero or one. We are all familiar with this. But in quantum, you also can have either zero or one, but not only. There is something more in there. So it can be written in superposition of, a, of, zero, of state zero and state one. The superposition in, is a linear combination and there are some numbers, complex numbers, alpha and beta, uh, kind of weights, probabilities. So mathematically, uh, this symbol of psi is called ket. So like the second part of the word bracket, that's where it comes from. It can be written as a vector, and I'll be explaining the states for qubits, so for quantum bits. So that's why they are two-dimensional. In general, there can be more than two, but we will stay with the qubits. So that here, this notation means that alpha is on the first entry and beta is on the second entry. Of course, you use the like informatics notation of such that the basis starts from zero. So please get used to this notation of cat. And what is important that the coefficients alpha and beta, they are complex numbers and their square of absolute values needs to sum up to one. Mm. There is also something called global phase. So we can multiply this cat times some like e to i phi. But this is something that we will neglect in this part because this is something I will not go too much into detail, but uh, this is something that when we measure the state, we won't see this. We won't uh, really, we won't need it for some time. So for now we neglect it. Okay, it's a, so it's called global phase and it's a feature that is non-measurable non physically. Just to, I mean, make the things a little bit complicated, but just to say quantum state is not a vector. Quantum state is a representation, uh, is an equivalence class of vectors that are of length one and are only different by, uh, by, this, uh, by this global phase. So that's formally mathematically how it is. In calculations, we just, wherever we see a global phase, we just don't care, we just can remove it. That's all. Okay, so let's go a bit deeper into some properties of this notation. It was introduced by Dirac and it's called bracket because of well, the word bracket. So I already mentioned that this symbol is called cat. So let's say that we have some two cats like psi and phi. And there is also bra. So if we, the symbol called dagger uh, does two things. First, it's the transposition of a vector and complex conjugate of the entries. So when we have a cat and do transposition and complex conjugate, we denote it by bra. And this notation is cool because it has some very useful features. So I mentioned three properties here. So let's begin with the first where we have classical typical bracket. So bra times cat. So first we have a horizontal vector with comparing to the original with uh, original vector, there are complex conjugates. And then we have a vertical vector. And when we multiply them, we get a number. 
so wherever you see a bracket, it will be a number that is made of uh, a scalar product of uh, two vectors. And if these two vectors are the same, you can just look at the previous equation. You get the coefficients, their absolute values and squares, you sum and you obtain one. So this is the condition that was in the previous slide that these alpha and beta, or actually their square roots of their absolute values need to sum to one. Okay, so that was bracket, but we can also formulate this and have cat bra. And then you have first cat, so a vertical vector and then bra, and we obtain a matrix. So this is a very useful way of writing matrices without writing all the coefficients of the matrix and all the entries. Uh, and this is also very often, often used in quantum information theory so that instead of writing the whole matrix, we just write cat and bra. Okay, let's stop here for a while. Who doesn't have a clue what's going on the, on the, on the presentation? And really be honest, who doesn't know what this inner product, outer product, for example, in, in Alina Algebra? I don't remember what inner and outer product is, but, but I understand what's going on. Yeah, so that's inner and outer product, basically. Inner, which is bracket, outer, get bra. Ah, okay. Yeah. The like on top by testing in pairs. It means complex conjugation. So it's a complex number. And you flip the number that is in front of I. <laughs> and uh, how, how is the variation called? Uh, the Hermitian conjugation, the dagger, you mean? Uh, no, no, no. Ah, yes, the, this thing. The dagger, the, the, the cross? Or the, the cross, the, the vertical line. The vertical line is just a feature of notation. Okay. So yeah. it is an inner product, but it is a feature of notation. That's the that's the point of this notation. That Basically, you just write two vectors next to each other, one which is row, one which is column, and you obtain a number in a, um, if, because of the inner product. Okay. So that's the point. And I, I, don't, I don't understand why you need the different notation for something that is a... <laughs> yeah, many mathematicians do not understand either. It is a trick that is used by physicists very often because if you fix a basis, then your calculations in this notation are very efficient in a way. You can, you will get familiar and you will see that uh, after you know, a couple of calculations that it kind of works. You can forget about some parts of linear algebra and just use this notation naturally. I would say there's another reason for this. In case we have great bigger dimension than two, then writing vectors, it's pretty time consuming and you need to remember always about how long the vector is. And this notation can be also used for greater dimensions. So then everything went much, much quicker. Yeah, but you can use the inner product for the same reason. No. Yeah. It's not always sufficient. Okay. And the, the one on the, on the bottom mm -hmm. uh, is, is not the same as the, the inverse operation. What do you mean so, by inverse? Uh, psi uh, vertical pi uh, the, the, the opposite is pi uh, vertical Sorry. you mean so this bracket so the first bullet is bracket it yeah. is in the product and the first bullet is cat bra yeah. so those are different operations because you have you, you vectors are switched the yeah. order of, of the vectors is switched but is it equal to the uh, to the switching the first one? What is what do you mean by switching? So I I, I don't know the name of the operation. Uh, do they have a name? Uh, the first one is cat bracket or inner product or okay. scalar product. Okay. And the second and the third one is outer product or cat bra. Okay. So what what I'm asking is if. Uh, uh, the inner product of uh, uh, the, the outer product is it, uh, it's equal to the inner product inverse? Not really, because inner product, the, the result of the inner product is a number. 
These are two different mathematical okay. objects. One is yeah. the number, another is the matrix. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good question. Have two elements. Uh, in general, there can be more. During this lecture, we'll just focus on qubits. In general, there can be qubits, and bits, and so on. What and do you mean to two elements? Can I? So it, when, on the top line, you find uh, psi and pi yeah. to have uh, these are two-dimensional. Two dimensional. Yeah, if we have two elements, those are qubits. If we have three elements, those are qubits. Then quads, whatever, we don't use this word. And then you can have, of course, infinity, infinity many, et cetera, in quantum mechanics, but it's not, not, not the point. In quantum computers are built of qubits. And then we will learn how to connect multiple qubits together. That's, that's basically what is coming. <laughs> yeah, but, but in general, in quantum information theory, we consider more general quantum states. Notation uh, exactly, and that's great. What's great about the notation? The overline? Yeah. It's complex conjugate. Uh -huh. So I mean, are, every time you see the over line, then it will be complex conjugate of a number, okay. a complex number. Okay. okay, so now I have a question for you. So if we know that quantum state is two dimensional vector, it's well, defined by two entries and all of them are, co are complex. And their sum of square roots of their absolute values might need to be one. How many real numbers do we need actually to uh, well write a quantum state? Any guesses? We have two entries in a vector. Each of them is a complex number. Each complex number has the form A plus BI. In other words, what is the effective dimensionality of the space of this, uh, these beasts? How many real numbers we need to use in order to uh, precisely describe the, this, this object? Nice try. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> Almost. You would be right if there weren't the condition of summing to one. Because then you only have three, the fourth one can be well deduced, knowing that they need to sum up to one. Yeah, so basically you have four two complex numbers, which means four real. One condition that reduces it to three, because you just uh, you have the restriction of the length of the vector, basically. So we have three three numbers that describe it. And then there is this additional condition of global phase which also reduces, takes away one real number out of this equation. So we have just, yeah, two real numbers that describe the state of a qubit. Just, uh, that, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Okay, so starting from now, we'll be thinking about qubits using another representation. It's called the block sphere. And um, well, so let's think about spheres, balls, and whatever of the shape. In this representation, every quantum state is a unit vector. So a vector of length one of uh, norm one, it starts in the well the beginning of the coordinate system. It's a sphere, like a three-dimensional sphere. And you can think of vectors in various directions. In this representation, the two well, well most well-known states zero and one correspond to directions up and down. So Every time in this representation, 
vector up is zero and vector down is one. Mm. There are also some, well, in, in general, there can be in any direction on the sphere. So you can see how much more well, information, how much, how deeper the notion of quantum state is comparing to the notion of bit. So like in qubit, in bit we will have just zero and one, and in qubit we have the whole sphere. And there are some other examples of um, very important quantum states, not only zero one, and these are denoted on this picture. So like those to the left and right, to the front and to the back. Mm. Later on, we'll play with them during some examples. But for now, it's important to remember that in every direction, there are some quantum states. And in general, there can be any direction on the sphere. OK, so I just have to want to add that there are, you can imagine there are physical systems that are described by this sphere. One physical system and one property, physical property that is very, like for me at least intuitive, is light polarization. So you know that the light can be polarized. That's probably in earth science it has to, it is very well known. So we have vertical and horizontal polarization. polarization. Vertical might be described as one, a zero, for example, and horizontal by one. So then you have diagonal polarizations, which are superposition, zero plus one, or zero minus one, depending on which one it is. So then the question arises, what is a polarization that is zero plus I one? I is a complex, the complex number. The, the imaginary, imaginary number. Do you have any clue? what it might mean. It is a physical feature that we use uh, very often, even in the 3D cinema. <laughs> oh, a vector. Okay, it's a vector. Everything is a vector here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it is, how is it called, you know? It is circular polarization. Yeah, so basically that's how you can imagine that. Uh, just don't do not be fooled by the fact that zero and one is on top and bottom, and we talk about horizontal and the vertical. That's basically those are different spaces. But polarization of a photon is an implementation of a qubit, physical implementation or realization. Of a qubit. Okay, and also on this picture. Note that we have zero and one and all the other states that are well, pointed in this picture, they are written as superpositions. They're in our combinations of zero and one. So if the state is a combination of some two other states, then we say that this is superposition. So it will be visible later on when we will talk about measurements. So this state, is neither in state zero nor in state one. It's in superposition of the state zero and one. Well, this is, doesn't have to be equal superposition, but uh, this is kind of on the block sphere in between. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell me why uh, all the time people talk about the superposition of this data? They lie. Yeah. It's a lie. <laughs> it's a it's lie. It's simplification, the... I would say. <laughs> so every time you, you hear that something is between, in between of the states, say that the probability of measuring the state in the state zero and one are equal. That should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. So it's kind of like a gyroscope just going around and then you stop it and see where it is. Uh, I would answer this a bit later when I have nice picture to the measurement. Mm -hmm. 
we can go back and explain it in, in detail. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand what zero and one mean in inside this notation. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Zero and one for now are just directions up and down. This is, you can think that you have a vector and it points either up or down. Every vector has the same length in this, every pure state. <laughs> They're more here. It sounds like the geometrical interpretation. It is. Okay. It is something that is useful uh, when explaining the gate model and uh, this way of thinking is simply useful about when we all work on qubits. So actually, mathematically, for for dummies, for some case. reason, it is like other those, color those are just vectors. A uh, color? Oh, sorry. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's. Okay. And, uh, and then, so you said that the like the norm is equal to one. Yeah. one but you said that there is another reason yet to decrease the time expansion. So what would global be phase? Okay. So if you multiply this vector by e to the so i phi, which phi, phi is a real number, this is called global phase. Effectively, when we write a quantum state of a qubit, we assume usually that this that the uh, amplitude uh, next to the zero, cat zero, is real. That's the representation we use. Not often, not always, but most very often. Then this problem disappears. Could you go over the, the equation of one or two in the power of half? Square root of two? Well, like the, the, the right one? That is everywhere. <laughs> okay. I, I just don't get that specific. Good, 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 good. That's okay. That's the reason why, why we are here. I mean, it's obvious, but at the same time, it's not. Like this one. Yeah, 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 exactly. Now this one. Hmm? So, the Look at this. <laughs> Comparing with this, this is the superposition of state zero and state one. So our alpha now is one over square root of two, and our beta is i over the square root of two. It means uh, for five degrees. Sorry. Why did you choose the square root? Because, because of this condition, alpha squared, oh. one over square root of two, which is alpha, plus i over square root of two squared, must be equal to one. Yeah, at first moment, it can seem tricky that not only this alpha and beta, but this square root of absolute values needs to sum up to one, but uh, I'm sorry about that. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, is that answer for your question? Yeah, so the bracket with zero is actually just alpha. Like it doesn't stand actually for just multiplying another vector with zero. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is, this is the very specific superposition that we have here one and here zero. So it's just alpha and beta, but it's simpler to write for this one zero and one because the positions in the quantum state. Yes. Yeah, in case if it was one and zero, then we got zero. And if this was zero and here was one, we would get the state one. Like the boundary of this. That makes sense. Okay, I don't see any other questions about qubits. So let's get to know how we get classical information about qubits. So the measurement. The measurement 
let's I will begin with the formal definition and later on we'll go through two go with details with two examples um, and pictures so measurement in general mathematically is a function it's a function from the finite set of measurement outcomes outcomes um, I will denote them by AI um, well, let's say that they are n of them. And to this, this function goes from the set of outcomes to the set of projection operators. And um, so while our A's are just, can be numbers, the projection operators are matrices. The projection condition means that matrix squared is equal to this original matrix. And uh, it's important condition of the measurement that the sum of these n projection operators needs to be the identity matrix. So the identity matrix is the diagonal matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So if somebody got some more about like, Measure of theory, it may, in mathematics, if somebody gets some more knowledge of know, know something, it's a measure. It's a... No, no, okay, it's, it's, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Because sometimes they're called positive operator way of measure. Yeah, yeah, but that's not really important here. It's, yeah, but it's cool. Yeah, there is, a, there is a way richer mathematical structure behind it, but it is essential what we need to know. <laughs> so, it's, from, it's a function from outcomes, think numbers or some symbols, to a set of operators which are projective and sum up to identity. Okay, what does it mean that pro, uh, uh, operators project? Do you, do you have a clue? No. If you apply it twice, it is the same. So you project it, if you project somebody on the floor and you it try to project it once again, he will stay on the floor. <laughs> That's projection. projection is some subspace. You can't go. You are you are on the subspace. You can't go anywhere else because you are already in this subspace. Like you go to the floor, you can't go deeper. <laughs> so this is the square. You would apply it second time, but you still wouldn't fall down again. Why well, it is important to have the identity matrix? Uh, yes, because the probability is must sum up to identity. Oh, okay. Okay. I want to make sure that you won't get probability like two. <laughs> that would destroy mathematics and my world. In many introductory texts, you will see lies about um, quantum measurement, and you will see that people say that you measure cat zero. It's not true. You cannot measure cat zero. It makes that doesn't make any sense. Or cat one. That's the reason why we are introducing mathematically what what it means really means. Sure. Uh, what's inside of this projection operator? It's always like, as you said, a matrix by two or? Uh, we will stay with this. In case of when considering qubits, so the vectors we were talking previously, if they are two dimensional, if they are if they have two entries, then the projection operators must be two, like two matrices. But if you have two, two, two qubits, then it is four by four. Three qubits, eight by eight. This is the dimension of the quantum system you are considering. But no matter how many qubits you have, it uh, still has this um, property of uh, p squared equals to pi. Yes. Yeah. So yes. if you are considering two qubits, so dimension four, then the projective operators would have dimensions four and four because they are square. So the same projection uh, condition has to hold and the sum, summing to add it also. Okay, so that was measurement, but measuring the state is still defined a bit different. So when we measure some state, and this state is psi, you get the measurement outcome AI with a probability P of P equals, and here we have bra of psi, PI, and of psi. And these probabilities 
well, because of this identity condition, they sum up to identity at one. This is, that's why it was important. I mean, simple calculation, but um, so you get the outcome A. So you get one of these outcome from the previous slide. slide. So for example, one of the numbers, one of the symbols with a given probability. So not that to calculate this probability, you have the one of these measurement operators, these projective ones, and you have the state like on both sides. So you here have bracket and you put this uh, projection, this matrix inside. So that it's a number, pro proper number. And the state of the system, after we measure it, it changes, it becomes different. It, it is here that you have this state, like C, I will denote it, I will denote it as AI, that it's this projection times cat, and this uh, denominator is just normalization so that it should be, well, so that all this con the conditions, uh, it's conditioned up to one, summing to one is fulfilled. Okay, summarizing. If you measure outcome AI, so this is a label, zero, one, whatever, sun, uh, cloud, whatever, then first of all, the first equation tells you about the probability of measuring the, this label. And the second equation tells you what happens once you've measured this label, but if, once you already have this label. So how the, how the state changes. This is That's a, a very deep question. <laughs> That's how it is. That's the greatest and worst thing about quantum mechanics. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, what does P stand for in the equations? Is it an uh, array, like a matrix? Or... The first equation, the P of A, I, oh, yeah, the is the probability uh, of obtaining in the okay, it's from the previous slide, one of these operators PI. You can have a few matrices and you just, to get the AI, you get the eighth uh, matrix and you put it well inside this. Don't worry, there will be an example. Uh, as a mathematician, I think about it as an axiom. <laughs> in quantum mechanics, they are called postulates. Mm, it's how it is. Uh, if you can verify it in laboratory, and you can even see it using polarizers and the polarization of light, actually. Uh, fortunately, there is, a there, there is a famous story about the coin when you toss it, it determines either heads or tails. It changes when you when it falls down. Yeah, so we don't there's, know. There's after the measurement, there's either this or this. But you know that the new state is given by that expression. Yeah. Yes. Mathematically, it's an axiom of quantum mechanics, but it is tested in the laboratory many, 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 many times in various systems. Okay, so let's. Consider an example. We will measure the state psi. The state is in superposition. So our alpha now will be one, a square root of 0 0.7, and beta is 0 0.3 times the imaginary i. And we will, and this was our state. Uh, and now we define the measurement. Remember the measurement was a function from measurement outcomes, A. So here the set of measurement outcomes is a set of zero and one, that's it. So as an outcome, we can get label zero or label one. And our mm, measurement operators are matrices P0 and P1. So, Consider simple example, there are two of them, but they are two dimensional. These are also very nice simple matrices. 
So there were two conditions about those projects about those uh, operators. So recall that it was that they are projective. So p squared equals p. So note that it is true for both p0 and p1. So if we multiply the matrix, each of these two by itself, it doesn't change. And also the matrices operators P uh, have to sum to, ident to identity matrix. So this is also very simple in this case, you add P0 and P1 and you get the identity matrix. matrix. And then, as we know that we can get either zero or one, let's think about the probabilities of obtaining zero and one. So here, how we calculated this. Well, let's begin with the probability of obtaining the outcome zero. So directly from the previous slide, we apply the first equation. So we have psi, p zero, psi, and I directly put all these, um, all these states. So we have first bra of psi, so matrix. Note the complex conjugate on the second element. There is minus instead of plus. Then I put the p0 and then another the ket vector, so the state psi. And simply multiply the vector matrix and vector and obtain 0.7. Similarly, when we get, when we want to calculate the probability of obtaining Q, Q or probability of one, we put instead of P0, the matrix P1. Uh, so again, we, we multiply the vector times the matrix P1 times the same vector Psi. And after multiplication, we get 0.3. So you can see that the probabilities sum to one, so well, our world works. Um, and these are the probabilities. So what else is left? The state after the measurement. Again, I rewrote the formula. So if it was the answer was label zero, then the state would be phi zero. So First, we have the written equation, and then um, it's answer. So, so first, I have the denominator. Like this is the same that was we were calculating in the previously. So notice it's a square root of the probability of obtaining zero uh, times the matrix p zero and the vector psi. And finally, finally, we obtain the already known vector zero, state zero. So if the answer, if the label was zero, then the state, state changes to the state zero. And if the answer to, of the measurement was one, after similar calculations, the one over square root of probability of obtaining one times P1 times the state psi, the, when we multiply it all, we obtain the vector one. The one from here. Mm -hmm. After the measurement, is it still like one root state or is it a big? It is a quantum state. It is a state. quantum state. Yeah, okay. So it depends. So it depends on how your apparatus is built. Sometimes the state is destroyed. So photons absorb. Yeah. But in mathematically speaking, we say in this particular set of axioms, that the state does exist after the measurement and it is a quantum state. And there are systems that you can measure multiple times and this rule should apply. So you, are, you measure once, you, have a, you obtain a label, the quantum state still exists. So you can measure the same state once again, for example, using the same operations, so, so same projections, then you would obtain the same label once again, because the probability of obtaining is one, because it's already projected. And you can you can multi, you can do it multiple times, and there is quantum Zeno effect where it is used, etc. There's plenty of applications that, but yes, most in, it is reasonable to say that state exists, the quantum state exists after the measurement. 
But and it still is quantum. Point. And it's quantum. Yeah. It's but truly quantum state. But the thing is that the after the measure is uh, is either zero or one. Cat zero in this case, cat it's either cat zero or cat okay. one. Yep. In the second example, it won't be this state. That would be another example of measurement. Mm -hmm. So if you measure this state after now again, yeah. it would stay the same. And because it's already in zero. Yeah. Here we don't have a dynamics. We just have state before measurement, state after measurement. There's no dynamics yet. So I mean, it's worth not emphasize here that the only classical information we get is that measurement outcome is either zero or one. This is the probabilities of this zero and one. This is something classical we get. This is the only information that at the beginning I was saying that uh, it was a picture of quantum and uh, what's inside quantum device and the classical world. So what, goes, what gets out of quantum to classical is just the label zero or one. Okay, finally the picture. So in the left sphere, we have the state we were measuring. So for those of you for whom is more clear to look at my pen, it's something like, it looks more or less like this. It's not up, it's not down. It's something that the direction is kind of in between. And now we choose the operators, zero and one, which also gives us some, we choose the basis. And in this, in this case, they also correspond to directions zero and one. So this measurement can be considered as asking a question like, hey, Qubit, are you rather up or rather down? And here we have the probabilities of getting up or down. So the question is if it's closer to the direction up or down. In here, you can see it's much closer to going up than down. So the probability of measuring zero, so the direction up is 0.7 because it's really close. And the direction of going down is only 0.3, but still possible. So the state, so if we get zero, then, well, we know it with probability 0.7 and the state changes to zero. But if we got the, the answer one, then the state would change to one. So that would be the first example. Any more questions? Because this is kind of tricky. So, so I have another example. So if not, Yeah. Uh, I have some question. I, I'm not sure whether you're going to talk about this uh, later today, but this uh, looks like uh, later on, for example, responses for neural networks or for any classical classifiers. And when they build uh, quantum machine learning, how that is like system is implemented into that? Or what maybe we should pay attention already now to describe this already? Okay. Uh, you will see later how it works. <laughs> it's uh, let's let's wait with the, I mean those are the rules of the game. We have the game. We have the game. We have to play because okay, that's the nature uh, that uh, uh, demands. I mean, imposes these rules on us. We cannot change them. Okay, maybe we can, but that's a philosophical question. So. Later, you, you will see how these rules can be applied. As you can see already, there is something, some non linearity actually. So, measurement introduces non linearity into the system. So, it might be useful. And there are partial measurements that uh, you can do. So, measure just some qubits, and some qubits are, uh, are untouched. So, the quantum state is preserved, and like superposition is partially preserved in this qubit. So you can play with these rules and to obtain interesting results. But here we just learn about the basics, the basic rules. 
what you are basically what what are the what is the chessboard and what are the pieces you can move on, and how you can move them on the chessboard. So when you have a zero point seven, will it become one or is it just more or less? Or if you have all points, if it go to if it will go to zero, yes. Uh, so it will go zero. It's more likely to go to zero. Uh, no. When you get the answer, the label zero, that you get it with probability 0, 0.0, but then for sure it will go to zero. Yes. So the, I mean, that's... answer zero and going to state zero, these are both like always go together. And getting the answer one and going to state state one go together. But the question is whether you do this up or down, whether. You... So if you are above. Uh, 0.5, like uh, in the last direction, if you just think about it like that way, uh, then you will go on. But if you're under, you go under. I would Not say always. if you Sometimes. if you do this, no, if if you perform this experiment like 100 times, mm -hmm. like 70 times it will go up, 30 times it will go down. Oh, yeah. Up to statistical error. Yeah, I mean, more or less. That's. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how is the uh, 0, 0.7 and 0, um, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, it will be soon. Okay. Yeah. On the next slide, I will give another example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Just follow up on the previous example. We found like 100 times uh, 70 go, go to one, but it goes zero, 30 go to one. What happens if you just do 10 experiments all up to thousands? That's the uh, number of experiments they roll here. In statistics, yes. So statistically, of course, because look, imagine that you would like to learn whether it is uh, uh, what, what is basically your probability of obtaining zero or one. Mm -hmm. If you do one experiment, okay, you have some information. If you then do ten experiments, you have more information. If you then move million times, you have well way better expectation value of your or estimation of your expectation value. Here, uh, because you you have more, more more tries, and it is really a problem in quantum computing that we do traditionally. You have a parameter: how many shots you want to do, so how many times you want to measure your system, and then you 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 receive a probability distribution that you infer some useful information from. So, um, in that case, uh, the seventy and thirty. Uh, these two numbers, it's still expectation numbers. So in the reality, it also can happens like a 69. Sure, yes, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is some variance attached to that, of course. But it's entire theory of statistics that you can apply here. Okay. Yeah, that's why we first, for now, we're just talking about probability of going up and down, not really about like, repeating the measurement. It's just averaging out to get a exactly. good outcome at your representatives. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another example. We will measure the same state. But this time the measurement will be different. Previously, we had the outcomes either zero or one. This time we'll have minus i and plus i. Uh, it will be clear later why these symbols, but let's for now assume that I like them. And we also have different measurement operators. This time they will be called Q minus I and Q plus I. So well, there are not so many zeros on this, those matrices. I, I'm sorry about that, but still it is quite easy to note that they fulfill the conditions of being measurement operators. 
So when you multiply each of these operators by itself, you get the same matrix. And when you sum these two, you get the identity matrix. Let me show the picture because, uh, so, yeah, maybe we switch to the picture and then go back to the mathematics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have the same, same state at the beginning, something like this, something in, in between. But this time we chose different directions. It's no longer up or down, but it's more like left or right. And the question is whether it will go for you, it's right or left. So look, that's important. The state is the same. The question is different. So the question is uh, actually this measurement operator or this measurement function. So different measurement, different pro probabilities for the same state and different states after the measurement have, have happened. So you're measuring the y axis instead of the z axis. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's also a language we can use. Yeah, in fact, simple language, you could also say that, dear qubit, are you rather left or right? Mm -hmm. So I would say I'm closer to, for, it's, I'm closer to right. So if probably the almost one, I will go to right. And you would get the state plus i. This is the common relation for the state. And with like very low probability, you would go to the left. And you would get the state minus i. Okay, now let's so go back to the, the questions. questions. Yeah. The measurement is defined by A, so the set of measurement outcomes. So minus I and plus I, and the measurement operators. And in these operators, you have the like those directions that are, that can be well, deduced from this form. So there are different equations to measure the different Yes. Yes. I mean, it's important which matrices are there, which operators are those Q, Q, like Q minus and Q plus. And then because everything else is similar, you, I just change the, those Q, P1, P0 and P1 into Q minus and Q plus and repeated the calculations. It's then you simply multiply vector times matrix times vector and get a number. And in a similar way, you get the state of states after the measurement. Okay, so that would be all for uh, quantum measurements. So quantum evolution, uh, the whole second lecture will be about it. So for now, I will just mention that the natural evolution of quantum state is rotation. So what we will do in quantum computing, we will be rotating the qubit on the block sphere. So the whole quantum computing is about rotations. They can be around different axes. So like in this picture, you have you can see kind of snapshots of dynamics, how it changes. Um, or you can choose another axis and perform com computations. You have a question. Any axis you choose. I mean, yeah. we use on the pictures, you have just vertical, but you can. Yeah, just as example. <laughs> to, uh, so the projections from the measurements? Yes. No. Not really. I mean, it depends on application. It depends on application. It's your choice as a designer. Okay, so the final part of this is the case if you have more than one qubit. So until now we were considering just one single qubit and, and that's it. But the system can be more interesting when you add another qubit. So let's say that you have two of them, two qubits, psi and phi. You already know the notation. So we have two vectors and well, some alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So altogether, they're 
like in the four dimensional space, like two for the first qubit and two dimensional for the second qubit. Mm. And how to mathematically combine these two. So for this, we use something called tensor product in mathematics known in its Kronecker product. So look at the equation in the middle. So we have the coefficient alpha, the first from the first uh, from the uh, state psi, and multiply it by the by the whole second qubit phi, and then you multiply the second coefficient beta from the first state times the second uh, qubit. So in this way, we get oh, every coefficient from the first and second in one vector. So note that this vector is four-dimensional. Mm. In general, you can add many, more and more systems. And we'll be using the notation that is introduced on the bottom of the slide. So similarly, oh, uh, there's a typo. Look at uh, comparing the equation and the vector. On the first entry of the, it's zero times zero. So it's the first entry of the matrix. There's coefficient alpha gamma. And then on like zero times one, uh, Kronecker like tensor product, zero times one, we have another and so on. But uh, usually we will simply uh, not write the tensor product. In case you have two systems, we will just write cat with two zeros, zero one, and so on. So you can think if you can see like zero zero is the first entry of the four dimensional vector. And you can see like it's in binary zero one, you have the second entry of the four dimensional vector and so on. Is it clear? Yeah. Two numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, zero, zero. Yeah, that's exactly. I, I can't really see. Oh, yeah, okay, that's, that's sorry, right. Good. Wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's simply notation. Yeah. And I just wrote exactly the same equation twice to make sure to, take, to show that it's simply a matter of notation well, because it's shorter. No, it is just a notation. We look, it's just a string. So now you need four, four entries of a vector. And this is in binary simply. Okay, so yeah, previous. Maybe just to follow hmm? up, I think what uh, uh, he's trying to ask is like uh, if you're zero equals to one zero in that vector format, what what would uh, be your zero zero looks like uh, in, in the platform? Because zero in the first in the top row it's equals to one zero. So what would be your zero yeah. zero looks like? Very good question and very elementary answer. Zero, zero is just one, that's one, zero, zero, zero. It's just exactly uh, 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 whatever. So zero, one equals two, zero, one, zero, zero. So what is one, one? Where is the one here? Let's split. Exactly. <laughs> so that's that's very easy, but unfortunately, you have to deal with this notation because it is used everywhere. And when you have, you know, hundred qubits, then you cannot write this ten to the hundred vector anymore. You have to 
the OIT notation somehow. Yeah, but you can write uh, sometimes like this when you have more qubits. This is much shorter. Is it because the sum should be one? Uh, and it's only one with one. Sorry, this one? Uh, Which are in, the, in the vectors. This? Uh, yeah, is it only one in one of these uh, places? Okay, let, let, let's show it slower. You have to look at the coefficients of the vector. Yeah, we'll go through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Zero times zero. So you have vector times vector. And you use the formula for the Kronecker for tensor product. So you get four dimensional vector. And first, you take the first coefficient from this one and multiply it by this, by the whole vector. So zero times one times one is one, one times zero, zero. And then you get this coefficient and multiply it by the second. So zero, zero. Okay, some other example over here. To what degree the mathematical rules that you have uh, reflect the uh, uh, physical process? Uh, as well as we know, basically to the level of the the best of the we can get from our civilization. <laughs> of course, I mean simplified because there are errors in the experiments and it's not so easy, but that's the mathematics of reality. And this this operation, um, so which was the, the tensor tensor product? Yeah. So uh, is this uh, still a rule, or is it just? Uh, it is also one of the axioms. Yeah, it's a rule. It's a rule. Yeah, with yeah. assumption of quantum mechanics, axiom and, of quantum. And what, um, so what does the composition mean uh, physically? Is it? Uh, very good question. Uh, you will see at the next uh, slide. slide. I mean, next lecture actually, and slide. So now let's let's okay. start with that, and we'll, we'll you will understand. Okay. So at the top, I rewrote the something we are considering previously. It's exactly the same uh, state. I just call it differently um, because it's a state on a two register, two qubits. So I use the notation to, um, that they are two states, like psi times phi. Let's assume that we have 30 qubits and we yeah. write them just like that. It is exactly the same on the top as it was in, on the previous slide. Yeah, exactly. And consider another state. This is also state in four, uh, like two qubits. It has four coefficients, four dimensional vector. And there's a question. Can we always find coefficients of A, B, C, D that correspond to like alpha to A gamma and beta to A delta and so on? So it that the coefficients with the same with the semi cats would be the same. It's obviously D is missing at the next one. Yeah. Just the type. So consider an example of a very, very specific state called a bell state. So the one at the top, one over square root of two. And this is the sum of the gets zero, zero plus one, one. So as you are very familiar already with this, so the question would be zero, zero is vector with one and zeros everywhere else. And one, one would be All zeros and one. So as for the question from the previous slide, can we always find the coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, and delta so that they correspond to this? And the question is unfortunately not. Actually, unfortunately or unfortunately, both and this is 
uh, we arrive at the phenomena called quantum entanglement. So in this case of the Bell state, that's how it's called like this state, it's entangled. It cannot be written as simply as the sum of all these coefficients. And this is this non-classical interaction between these two qubits. Want to say something? Go on. Just preparing the homework. Actually, I wanted to ask if there are any questions. That's it's important. <laughs> So in this case, that is impossible because if we have zero, zero, so then it would mean to mean that alpha times gamma is one over square root of two, but that's in contradiction with this, that's uh, also one over square root of two it needs to be equal to beta delta, but it's impossible because of zeros and uh, the coefficients with zero, one and one zero must be equal to zero and they can't. And you should be amazed by this one. Are you? <laughs> Einstein was. <laughs> yeah, that's a very important feature in quantum mechanics that we cannot, when we have two objects, two qubits that interacted in some way, I mean, not any way, but Typically, typically, when they're interacted, they cannot be treated separately. They have to be treated jointly. So when you change one, you have to change another. Yeah, it's one system. Even if those are two photons, where one is on the Earth and seconds on the Mars. If they interacted in the past, or even there was some kind of uh, interaction between them, even not direct in the past, these two photons are one quantum system. And we do it now, for example, using satellites, distributing these kinds of entangled photons among cities in, in Europe, from, in, in the world, from Beijing to Vienna, for example. Even there are ways to entangle photons indirectly. So two photons that never interacted with each, other, with each other interact with photons that actually interacted or are from one source, and we can distribute this kind of states all over the world. And that is important because that's the basis for quantum cryptography. If you have these states and you know that you have them, or actually you don't have to, but uh, okay, that's complicated, then you can have quantum cryptography with these states. And that's pretty amazing. That's the reason quantum mechanics will. It's like if you had two coins and you would know what's on one, you would know what's the other, what's in the other, and even if they were separated, separated like distantly. So if you have one photon uh, have interacted just like the two of them and not nothing else, uh, one here and one in Poland, yep. uh, you could communicate with those photons. Like Almost. Those. But the measurement outcomes are random, so you <laughs> cannot communicate. But you do can do something important. You can correlate your data, or you can create random strings, which you know that you only you for some reasons, so called monogamy of entanglement. You know that only you and the other party has a random string that is exactly the same. Uh, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we do it. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 it's, we, there's a break. It's the end of the presentation for this part. So that's the end of this part, exactly. Yeah. So we are at the end of this lecture. Mm -hmm. The first virus simple one is why this state called fail states. Um, another question is like, uh, can you also entangle like more than two objects yep. or is that limited to two? Uh, the first is because of the name. Though. Yeah, that was the guy, the, the, the Scottish, uh, uh, no Scottish, uh, Irish, uh, Irish physicist John Bell, that in the 60s were, was investigating this stuff very and heavily. As for the second questions, question is, uh, yes, you can. 
and that's where things get crazy because you have three systems that it's not that obvious that you can uh, like and have an angle first second that you can first second third yeah. second third and first third and many interesting things happen there in short if you have two qubits there is only one number so called schmidt number that describes the amount of entanglement you have in your system whatever it means in how close they are and, like and basically there's one number that describes it in, in, in entirely if you have three qubits it is already five uh, dimensional manifold which is relatively complicated and people do study these three qubits yeah it's really not and even mathematically sometimes it's difficult to discuss what happens with these three qubits even with three qubits a matrix a vector of eight uh, of eight entries <laughs> simple answer is yes so very much yes happens when like there is three qubits and one of them is also entangled with another three qubits right so yeah, be, then you have entanglement with the entire system and entanglement can be you know you have these hypergraphical connections and you can you can have a cons very complicated construction of entanglement and it is what quantum computation does it entangles the states together and then measures them <laughs> that is basically what you have how uh, what happens how what is the how we can interact and you will see quantum gates that basically introduce entanglement in the system so i guess the next level of Cyber warfare quantum is there. It's not next level, it exists already. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's like uh, corrupting the entanglement by entangling it with uh, extra one. And yeah, 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 but it doesn't work. Mathematics does not allow you to eavesdrop. That's the point. No, quantum no. cryptography is secure because the rules of quantum mechanics that do not allow you to eavesdrop. No, no, because uh, this, if you would entangle an extra one, it would fuck up the stream, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, you can destroy, okay, you destroying destroy states it. is easy, destroying this uh, space is easy, but is dropping is difficult. First of all, there is a food, so that's a good news, and bad news, okay, Joe, look into, go into Google, write this, this, uh, this, this letter, I mean, this string of uh, SNBC, the quantum talk, into Google, and read a comic that is there, uh which is very good it's very important piece of information this coming uh, by i don't remember the name of the guy but it was uh it was done with cooperation with scott Armstrong, one of the most important quantum computation guys in, in the world and that's really important the, the insights and the questions you will have uh in this very funny very well designed and uh, interesting comic. So just to make a quick introduction, the second lecture is basically how to compute using these rules and what we can achieve using these rules uh, in a very simple example, actually. Okay, so in this part of this lecture, I will introduce quantum gates, uh, show you some examples of them, show you examples of uh, like single and two qubit gates, and uh, the main part of it will be the example of the algorithm, is known as Deutsch algorithm, which is um, pretty simple, but it will be also it will be also like very step by step, and we will go through it slowly, so that uh, you could understand how it works how you can do something kind of useful with this. So in general, we will be talking about quantum gates and quantum circuits. So here's an example of a quantum circuit. Uh, later on, we'll be talking about it, this one. But for now, how to understand it more or less, uh, how to read this picture. So first, when we perform computation, we need to prepare some input. So we prepare some qubits. That's why we previously were talking about a tensor product, how to combine qubits. So now when you have a line, it's one, it's called register, and you can think that it's a one qubit on every line. So in this case, we have 
two qubits at the beginning we have two in input state zero uh, tensor product one we can prepare some input usually it's uh, like very often it's only zeros but general can be something else like here it's zero one and then we apply quantum gates i will soon explain more about it but for now they will be just boxes with some gates some of them can act only on one register some of them can act on more registers there can be in various configurations there can be various gates and finally we will perform a measurement well to get some information about this quantum system so this is more or less how computation works we have input perform some quantum gates and measure and then we get the information and after we analyze the results and do some post-processing like we were talking last time during measurements it's only with some probability so sometimes you can repeat it and so on okay but before we will be talking about quantum <laughs> gates let's have a quick review of classical gates i think most of you are very familiar with this who is not familiar with these pictures Okay, okay okay so you have to explain it. okay so this is kind of like like logic so x and y are considered as bits so also zero one or true or false uh, so so when you have in the left you have one bit gate so the second is negation so first is the first gate does nothing it doesn't change it doesn't change uh, anything so if it was if if x was one, uh, zero then after the gate it was also zero but in the second uh, gate it changes it flips the the state so if it was zero it will be one and if it was one in the first picture it would still be one and the second picture the negation it would be zero and uh, the logics in the second uh, second row that we have two bits so x y so they can in every configuration um, or we can have zero 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 one one zero one one so if one of these is one all of it is one okay that, that's that yeah it has to be it has to be written down because if you don't know it it's So that's for two gate gate this one x y we have x or y x here y here x or y here. So exactly, if only at least one of these is one, we get one. So that's if both of both are zeros, then we get zero. What is important for these that people that don't know? The, the last gate, which is X or so if one is oh, only one input is one and second is zero, the output is one, otherwise it's zero. This is the basis of all the computation we do classically. All the computers can be built out of this single gate, basically, and final, but whatever. So this is the fundamental of our civilization, basically, <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> Okay, so just for completeness, this, this was or it is as if only if, it, if at least one of these is one, then we get one. And the second next gate is end. So uh, both need to be one. And then we have uh exclusive ors so it is one if and only if exactly one is zero and the other is one what is important to remember is that classical information is encoded on bits and these operations operate on bits there are entries and out outputs output entries are bits outputs are bits and we process bits of information, so zero and ones. That's basically what 
this slide means. <laughs> exactly, and you can have one bit and there's the output also one bit and you can have like come here like two bits and then after the gate you get just one bit. Not that it, the number of bits is decreases. Later on, we will be talking a lot about uh, the last one. So just know that this will be the, the important one. So this is uh, one if and only if they are different, like zero and one. One of them is uh, one. OK, that was classical. So let's do quantum. The general quantum gate will be denoted like this. and. There is some input cat psi, some state, and then we apply the quantum gate. So mathematically, as the output, you get a matrix U, which is a unitary matrix, times uh, the cat the state psi. Mm. I will go to formal definition later on because I think we don't need it for now. And I mean that's how you should think about it. It's a linear operator that acts on a, st on a state, which is a vector. And what is important here in the second block, when you have in time t equals zero, some state psi t equals zero, and you applied some unitary gate, then you get some another state psi at time equal one. But this is reversible. So as I mentioned previously, these are rotations mostly, so it can be reversed. So here we used uh, that U dagger. So it's similarly at the beginning, I introduced the dagger for bra. So you also do a transposition and complex conjugate of the entries. So then U dagger of psi at time t equal one is equal to the state at time equals zero. So this is like something that wasn't uh, similar, not similar to the previous the classical gates. This is something much more quantum. So reverse it, this reversible. <laughs> there are many philosophical implications, implementation uh, uh, implications. But what is important that sometimes you can do, uh, you can go with your state for computation forward. Do something with your with your data and go back. And sometimes it is useful because, for example, you can reduce the amount of memory you want to use. Um, but it is a fundamental fact of quantum mechanics that quantum computation is reversible, um, and that's a very different from classical. In classical, if you know just the output, you don't know what was, was the input. In quantum, like in if here, you, you get the output, you don't know what was the input. You can't reverse it simply. Yeah. Okay, I mentioned rotations. So here are examples of rotations and the pictures how those matrices look like. So on the left, we have rotation around uh, y axis. And this is exactly the form of the matrix when you would like to rotate by the angle uh, gamma. And then you can choose another axis. So let's say Z and the angle beta. And then for changing beta, you have the evolution. So the state rotates around this axis. Do you, do you understand the, I mean, do you know the matrix on the left? That's something you should be familiar with usually. I mean, people that work in geometry, anything. It's rotation, just rotation of a vector on a plane. So part, on this particular plane, it's, uh, it's uh, around the axis y, so y is per perpendicular. It's just rotation. And the second matrix also rotation, but on a around, around different uh, axis. So on some course on linear algebra, you probably met this left matrix. What is gamma and beta? Numbers? 
Angles. Angles. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here let me introduce some most important quantum gates. So these are the very often methods, like very, very, very useful uh, one, single qubit gates. So the first is identity. Well, you can guess the matrix of the identity, so it does nothing. So later on, I will simply write a line instead of writing the identity because it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the qubit. Then there is another, there is X gate. And the X gate changes the coefficients like A becomes a, uh, alpha becomes beta and beta becomes alpha. So they are exchanged. Look at this uh, output. It's it was alpha, beta, and x times is beta alpha. Then you have, a, then you can have y gate. And uh, this is actually very similar, but you need to add the imaginary number and some minus. So if it was y, You have minus beta i and alpha i. And then you have z, which does a very simple thing that changes the sign in between. So beta well, becomes minus. So it only changes the second entry of the vector. Finally, you can change only the phase. So you can rotate like beta. So you can add e to i phi. So uh, it doesn't impact the first entry, only the second, but add some phase. It is called relative phase, relative phase, rather than global phase, as you can see. So it's a relative phase between zero and one, not global phase of the entire vector. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you have no identities, you always have quantum channels, and uh, it's way more complicated than that in the hardware, obviously, but that's the just language, mathematical model of what is what quantum computing means. And then on top of that, we deal with errors. And we're dealing with errors is a very long story <laughs> that is just beginning in the hardware. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, why you say is that always five rather than also important, for example? So are there like how many gates that you can have and why you call this five as the important ones? Uh, I chose these five because they have nice, nice matrices. <laughs> okay. uh, she's a mathematician, so you know she likes about she she cares about beauty of uh, of, of, of the mathematical objects. Um, you have you can have rotations like, like on previous slides. Yeah, but these matrices are not that nice. They have trigonometric functions and it's complicated. <laughs> uh, look, the identity matrix. Okay, it's obvious because identity X Y Z are called so called Pauli matrices that you will see. These everywhere. are special. They, they are everywhere in quantum mechanics if you deal with the uh, qubits. And then we, we wanted to show a parameterized gate that you can see that, that it that doesn't have to be fixed. You, you can have some parameters on top of that. And it is also important to have a relative phase because out of relative phase, you can build quite a lot of quantum algorithms with X, Y, Z. So there are many others. That was a good question, but those are like the fun, some kind of building blocks at least partially. Well, for the investigation. Basically, each of these rotations can create a gate. Yes. Okay, but there is one special gate. It has slide for its own. 
It's called Hada Mortgate. It's also beautiful because it has only ones and minus. And uh, it, what it does is superposition. So when you apply a Hadamard gate on the state zero, so on the block sphere direction up, you have the state like left. And when you apply it on the state one, you also obtain a superposition, this time with the sign minus. So this is so truly quantum gate. It is extremely useful in, uh, in everywhere in quantum computation. So this goes from direction up and down to direction right, left. So we have superposition and it's cool. And uh, just remember it, it's a great. Great gate. <laughs> great gate, Hadamard gate. Okay, and this will be probably the answer for your question about number of gates, how many of them we need. So it's time for formal definition of a unitary matrix. So here it's written on the first block that unitary matrix times unitary is dagger. Dagger means transposition and complex conjugate of their elements uh, is equal to identity. So maybe in some, there are some equivalent conditions that for example, the uh, columns of unitary matrix are form an orthogonal basis. If somebody likes linear algebra, um, for some other, maybe they also some, uh, their eigenvalues are uh, on the unit circle. They have in general very nice properties, mathematical properties, maybe some physical probably as well. Uh, <laughs> but in general, every quantum, every gate is a unitary, must be a unitary matrix. And what is important? Unitary is reversible, doesn't change the length of the vector, yeah. and it's a generation of rotation. It is just rotation on complex Euclidean space. It is what it, it is what it means. Unitary. Okay, so now there is a question. You want to get some rotation from one state to some other fixed, and how many rotations around axis, specific axis, you need? Because of course you can't have, you can have many gates and usually it's easy, the easiest way to use rotations around those X, Y, Z axis on the glass sphere. So it's sufficient to rotate first around Z, then around Y, and then again around Z axis. And then you can get any, uh, any direction by this. And uh, this is written in the second block. So you can actually do any rotation using those three rotations around these three axes. And here are the matrices of this, as I mentioned, not that beautiful. But it should be quite clear when you take a pen and start rotating it, that you need to first do some around one of these axes and then around another and then go back to the first axis that you can exactly get every direction of this. And actually, it is what we do with quantum computers and quantum computers, these rotations. Okay, they can be on different axes depending on the hardware, but that's what, what is important. Sorry? Instead of classical matrices. What is a classical matrix? <laughs> yeah, so what you mean by classical matrix would, in this context would be uh, would be a binary matrix of a, of a finite field. <laughs> yeah, Z2 field, but that's... Uh, pardon? No, no, if you go to random processes, it's uh, more complicated, yeah. But uh, that's important that we just use rotation we just rotate and what it can it does it changes the 
of amplitude. So these coefficients are these you know, these complex numbers that our state is described by. So quantum computing is engineering of these complex numbers, which it's only then leads rotations. on rot using rotations, which leads to constructive and destructive interference. Actually, rather than like in probability, you have only constructive interference. So you can just add the probabilities together and you have positive real numbers there. In quantum, you have also negative or complex actually, but negative is good enough usually, like thinking roughly about this idea. So construct destructive interference is the main feature of quantum computing in a way, like for high level, from high level. Destructive interference? The waves that are... Okay, you can interfere, you just have. Yeah, you have the waves. So you have waves that interact with the constructivity, so they add up, or they you can you can reduce the, the amount of weak link in the wherever in the field by just uh, adding two waves on, on on top on top of each other. That's basically like the story behind it. So given a matrix, you want to find this representation. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know how to do it like exactly like right now, top of my head, but yeah, you can decompose. So the question is the composition of a matrix. For a qubit, it's easy. For a larger system, it's, it's challenging. So that's basically finding this decomposition is programming quantum computers. <laughs> Okay, if there are no more questions about single single qubit gates, then let's go to something more complex when we have more than one register. So let's begin with C node gate. We have two registers. Like on the first, there is some input X, and on the second, there is some input Y. And X and Y are bits, are just zeros and ones yeah, treated now, as bits here. Exactly. So if on the first register there is zero, then do not we don't want to change the second register. However, if in the first register there is one, we do the not on the second register. And here you can see it in the table. So we have input one and input two, the first and second uh, bit, and the output, the first of second. So the second bit changes if there was one in the first. And if it was zero, then it's still the same. And this gate is, because it's on two register, it's four-dimensional matrix. So here you can see its form that what it does is actually changes the coefficients of the, of the second register. So alpha, beta uh, do not change and gamma, delta change places. So for computer scientists here, it is basically XOR on the second qubit and copy on the first, like that's it. Or we can think it about uh, in a slightly better way, just switching the last two entries, complex values in the, in the state of the, like describing before and after the, the application of this gate. Of the, of the, of the basically, we're just adding the level of complexity to the primary uh, property should come at the same, but it should be a unitary transformation. It is a unitary transformation, and if you are, Mathematically inclined, you see that it is only a permutation, actually, which is subset of unitaries. Yes, but I mean, in general, that yeah. we, are, we have a two bit uh, or two or more bit uh, transformation. Two cube, yeah. If you have two qubits, it is also you, a unitary, you apply, but four and four. Yeah, it's a four by four unitary matrix. Any four by four unitary matrix is a two qubit transformation. 
yeah, but this is the first specific example of those you know, two qubit gate and well, because it's very often used and it has fundamental meaning in, in this. And it's important to note here that why well, it's called controlled node because the first register actually controls the second. And just we control whether it's what's on the first, then it results in what's in the second. Although the first doesn't change. In general, you can have any controlled unitary. So if we have some unitary matrix like this U, it works similar way that you control by the first register and the controlled register is the second. So if there is zero, then you do nothing on the second. But if there is one on the first, you apply the unitary gate U. And here's the general form of the of this matrix of the control uh, unitary gate. So note that in the previous example, the unitary matrix, the small block of this bigger one, had the form of of not. And it was a challenge for many years, and still is, to, to implement to build this uh, controlled unitaries into in quantum computers or control nodes. That's a technical challenge. That's the reason why we don't have quantum computers now. I mean, one of the reasons, but uh, like fully functional, very good quality quantum computers. Building this kind of gate is challenging stuff in the laboratories. But we know how to do it now, like in the terms of civilization. I personally don't, but <laughs> as a scientist, we know. Okay, what else can we do having two registers. We can, for example, swap the registers. There's also specific notation for that. So we simply like, change what was on the first register goes to the second, and what was the second goes to the first. So you can also see the matrix of this swap gate. So it's also at some other permutation matrix. Mm. And this time it changes the second and third entry of this may vector mm. question okay. uh, is the generation of gates actually a research type task by itself eventually because there is a set of logs plus how trick mm -hmm. that you can do with one with two bits but in a sense uh, is the generation of what do you mean by generation i don't get I it mean, creation of some I mean, mathematically or in like something useful out of yeah yeah that's engineering quantum systems okay finding a good gate and how to implement it in the hardware and why is it useful and how to compose these gates so you will see it later yeah that's that's a sometimes difficult task sometimes we know how to do it sometimes we cheat and basically say yeah we don't have to know how to do it actually we'll see we'll see an example of that we we can be clever about it we can be a little bit stupid sometimes yes but engineering quantum gates either in the theory or in the physical systems and how to connect each other and to have to translate each other yep it's the entire field <laughs> okay. yeah, it's fine to understand how, how this is still of quantum computation yeah Okay, but swap gate is something that has its classical counterpart part, and it's, I think, quite intuitive. But there is something truly quantum, even worse, there can be a square root of swap. And it's more difficult to find some interpretation, but it works. And here you have a matrix, you can see what's the uh, output of it. Let me provide an interpretation for that. You, we, here we have discrete time uh, where we have gates that are applied one after each other. But we know that physics is continuous time. I mean, up, until, uh, up to some approximations, but we know that it's continuous time. So actually, we have differential equations that you will see later that drive a system from uh, one position to another and implement the quantum gate. And this square root of swap is basically driving have willing to swap two systems or two qubits, but actually 
stopping it in between, just be going only halfway. And then we are in the superior position in a way of swapping them and not swapping at the same time. That's the story behind squares of swap, why, why it is really even considered discussed. Okay, so let's consider some example. Um, that will be an example of a circuit that contains two of those gates we were uh, recently discussing. And well, just let's see how it works. So at the beginning, we have the input of two zeros qubits, so standard way, uh, as simple as possible. And then we apply Hadamard gate on the first register, and then we apply the, the C node gate, like we control by the first, and we look at the, uh, well, the controls node. So the first part, let's think about what happens after the Hadamard gate. What we do, you can see in the first equation that we have the Hadamard tensor product identity, because on the second register, nothing is happening, times the state zero, zero. So that's how we apply a, a unitary gate on a state. And what we know that how Hadamard gate works, let me remind you of the picture here. It moves from the direction up or down to the direction left, right. So when we applied Hadamard on the state zero, you get, zero plus one over square root of two. And this is what happens on the first register. So on first register, we have the superposition of zero plus one times the square root of two. While on the second register, nothing happens. And I wrote this as in a form of a, a vector. So on zero times zero, so the first entry have one, and then on the third also one, and zeros on the second and fourth. So this is the state of the system after applying the Hadamard gate, but before CNOT. So let's go on and apply CNOT. This is the second equation. On the second equation, we apply the CNOT gate. This is the matrix of the CNOT, and we apply it on the uh, that was calculated previously. And then you can see that it was simply changing the third and fourth entry. And we obtain a state that we have already seen. Does anyone remember this state? Exactly, yeah. this is the well state. Yeah. So this is a secret that create entanglement. This is the... Let's stop here. Do you get it? That's the first non-trivial circuit you see. Do you get it? Do you get algebra behind it? Look, step by step, what happens. The rules were already there. We are just putting them, putting them together. Because without that, you cannot understand what will follow. Will follow. Does anybody have any questions? Just the numbers in zero and like zero mm -hmm. are longer vector, vectors, basically, not two by two, because you mentioned initially there were not two by two, but like two element vectors now they are bigger because one is mean, bigger. Two, because two times two together is yeah. four, yeah, has like four. four, but like two is two dimensional. Every case with single zero inside is two dimensional. I mean, zero times zero. This is two, this is two. When you multiply, you get four. Yes. Okay. I see no questions. So I think we are ready to go to the problem of Deutsch algorithm. So the formulation of the problem is that we have some binary function. For now, it's simply a function that takes either zeros or ones. 
And as a result, we get also either zero and ones, nothing quantum here. Some of this, let's assume that this function is either constant or balanced. So constant function is simple that whatever is the input as the output, we get the same value. Balanced is a function that half of its values are zeros and the other half are ones. And there are only these two options. Yeah. We just consider these two options. We know that this function we are given is one of these two, either constant or balanced. So consider the case when we have just the function that has one input and one output, the simplest possible case. And let's look at the table. There are only four possibilities here. You have the uh, f of zero and f of one, and what, what's, uh, what is the output? So there can be two constant functions, f zero and f one. So the first f zero gives us only zeros, whatever is the input. There can be also constant function, which gives one that no matter what the input is. And these two are constant, and the only constant in this case for uh, one dimensional example. There can be also identity function, which simply doesn't change anything. So if we get zero, then the output is also zero. And similarly, when we get the input one, output is also one. And finally, that can be bit flip, so it changes the value. So when we get zero, when we get input zero, gives one, and when we get one, the output is zero. So this uh, third and fourth function are balanced functions. And now the problem is, given a function f, decide whether it's constant or balanced. And the question for you is, how many times do we need to apply the function? normally without any quantum uh, algorithm and so on to decide whether it was constant or balanced. Two? Yeah, exactly. And that's a stupid problem. That's the yeah. point here. It's a very stupid problem, but it, there is a story behind it, which is important. <laughs> that's the point. You think the algorithm we do it using just after one shot. In general, it can be, of course, the scale can be different, but in this example, we're talking, it will be enough to use this function just once to decide. Okay, so before going to the circuit of the algorithm, let's discuss two tools that will be used. In, actually, it only consists of things that you already know, but let's just focus on them. So Hadamard gates, something we were discussing recently. But when we apply Hadamard on each register, it has some great property. Let's look for the case of two qubits. With a first equation here, we applied Hadamard and Hadamard on only zeros, and then we get the state like plus and another copy of the same state on the second register. And after some uh, simple algebra, I got equal superposition of all the four basic states. So we see these coefficients are the same. It's one half everywhere. So it's zero, 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 one. So when you apply Hadamard transform, that's how it's called when we apply Hadamard gates on each register. We, apply, we obtain a very nice vector like one half with only ones. And this works for the case of more registers. It doesn't have to be two, it can be more. And this is great because in general, we get the same superposition every combination of this zero and one is there with equal coefficient. Okay, so one question. Imagine that we have this state and we measure in like zero one basis. So this, we just ask for zero ones. What are the probabilities of obtaining each of the string? So 
So imagine that we have this state, this, this state that is on uh, one half zero zero plus zero one zero one zero etc. What are the probabilities of obtaining labels zero 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 one one zero one one? Yeah, equal. Equal. <laughs> and, yeah, that's a stupid question, obviously. But uh, and the same, of course, goes with the larger states. And we have one over two to the n, four more qubits. So one eight, one sixteenth for each. That's it. Okay, so let's talk about this function we are given, and we want to decide how it whether it's constant or balanced. So we'll introduce some specific unitary gate. Uh, and that's how it works. As the input, we have x, y. And the first register doesn't change. Why in the second, you obtain exclusive or of y and the output of the function. So here I wrote also the table of XOR. That was one of these logic gates we were talking at the beginning. And so it's one if and only if one of the input is zero and the other of the input is one. Mm. You can think also about this, like there's a black box and this function, this gate is given is inside and you either want to decide whether this function f is constant and balanced and it's hidden in this black box in this gate. Okay, let's look how it works on some basic example, I mean, how this unitary gate works. So let's apply it on the state zero, zero. And then the first zero states and the second is exclusive or, and depending on, on this, whether f of zero is zero or one, we got, you obtain a state either zero, zero or zero, one. It can be also written using this value f of zero, so I calculated this all for all those four uh, vectors, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Mm. And this is simply a trick of notation that you see whether it, when it's f of 0 is 0, uh, then it's 1, and the other f of 0 is 0. And one of them also dis always disappears. So it works with this uh, first equation. I just calculated all of these for those four vectors because we will use it uh, soon. Finally, we can see the uh, circuit of the Deutsch algorithm. So actually it's the same circuit I showed you at the very beginning of the lecture, as an example. And that's how it works. We prepare the input, zero, one. Then we apply the Hadamard transform so Hadamard gain on each register. Then our black box, meaning the gate uh, we were discussing recently. And then again, we will need to use the Hadamard on the first register. Finally, we will get the answer when we measure the first register. So let's go step by step. And uh, let's use the things we were discussing uh, like during the last 10 minutes. First, apply the Hadamard transform. So the first step of the algorithm will be like in here, Hadamard on the state zero one. So on the first, so using the, we know how Hadamard uh, state uh, gate works. So we have the state of the first register and the second. Uh, Note the minus on the second register because the, the state was one. And as the output, we get superposition of all those four states. Um, but this time one is plus, second is minus, and then plus minus. Then we will apply the unitary gate, the gate we were discussing. So we apply UF on the state C1. So actually, because of linearity, we apply UF on each of these four gates. And that's exactly what I showed you just after introducing this unitary gate. So I summed it all. 
So after some simple algebra, mm, this is what we get. So the sum, it depends on f, f on f0 and we have the first register and some superpositions. For now, I do nothing visible, but let's wait a bit. And we need to apply the second Hadamard on the first register. So as in the example previously, apply the Hadamard gate and identity of the second register, because uh, let me remind you the circuit. We applied Hadamard gates, then the unitary, and then Hadamard on the first again. So here we are with the Hadamard on the first register. Mm. So after the calculations, after just algebra and rewriting it all, and uh, what we obtain uh, is written here. And let's look at this carefully. So if the function was constant, what do we know about the first register? So if f of zero and f of one is the same, what is the state of the what is the state of the first register? Uh, and if they are uh, balanced, so if f of zero is different than f of one. Either one there or not one or something else. So either you modify the first first uh, part or not. Uh, could you say a bit louder? I I mean it seems like if they are identical, you do not modify the first state. If they are identical, then you don't modify it, it, the first state remains the same. The mm -hmm. first element of superposition, in a way. Yes. Yes. That's... Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will be modified in a certain way. Yeah. yeah. That's basically mm -hmm. the, that's the point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the key point is here that this, what uh, depending whether it's constant or balanced, you have. We know what is this should be the state of the first register. So what we need to do is simply to measure the first register. And we can and get to know, know this. this Sorry? And then, you and then you know whether it was constant or balanced. You wanted to say something. Yeah, but what's important? We know only whether it was constant or balanced. We applied the gate only once. So we used superposition, entanglement, and uh, applic single application of a gate to retrieve some information about the function. We Not don't know all exactly of the... which, which of this it was. Yeah. We know it was constant, for example, but we don't know which one. But if it was balanced, we know it was balanced, but we don't know which of these two balanced functions it was. But still, we use this just once, not two. Okay, so we just obtained some information about the modification of the System. Yeah, we obtained some information about about the problem, about generally speaking the problem. It's a stupid example, but this example is very didactic because it shows you a couple of elements that you can put together how to engineer the amplitudes of your quantum state to retrieve some information about whatever you are studying. That's important. And of course, you see the mechanics of calculation, so the algebra and how to think about algebraically about the, the, the quantum algorithms. It's useless, but people are building huge computer like quantum systems to try to run it, but it's very in interesting. At the same time, of course, if you want to implement it, you know the function in the first place. <laughs> so it's just Oracle problem. And okay, that's the entire story of Oracle problems, etc. doesn't matter. Basically, combination of Hadamard gates allows us to uh, decode the random 
modification of a matrix in a certain way? In a way, yes. And C node. You need to have this entanglement here. So that is important. Hadamard and C nodes together. Okay. Okay. You can think that this Hadamard transform allows you to calculate all on all the possibilities at the same time. You can you can have zero 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 one, and because of the superposition, you calculated it simultaneously. Okay, but the question of the limitations of the F should be binary, otherwise. Uh, yeah, in this case, that's <laughs> the. <laughs> yep. Can you show me your again? Which one? Uh, the unitary. Unitary, sure. Yeah. This one. Yeah. That is the encoding of the binary problem on the unitary matrix. That's how it, we understand that. It's one is encoding. We can have different encodings of data on unitaries. We'll see it later. But this is one way of to do it, to do it. And that requires some insights. It's not like there is no prescription how to do quantum algorithms. As in every case of algorithm, algorithmic theory, you need to think, you need to, to work with uh, what was already discovered, to combine algorithms together, etc. It's a piece of uh, ingenuity required to do so, to do that. So if this unitary UTA has access to the, to the function, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many times does it work? Once. Once. That's the point that we, we can do it once. But thanks to superposition, it actually works on each possibility. But at the same time. Mm -hmm. If you want a stupid story, right? Once again, the superposition causes this uh, state to go to the different universes. So we have multiverse and these functions applied on the those values and then recombined by the by the Hadamard gate. In a way, that's also useful story, not very, it's very complicated, uh, the interpretation of quantum mechanics are complicated, but in a way you calculate this function on two different, in two different paths of the of the of the space-time, whatever, and then just combine combine the results and get the outcome out of it. That's you know, the story, just the story and hand wave. <laughs> but what's important, of course, is just the detailed algebra behind it. Actually, it's like a really smart combination of tricks. Yeah. Uh, like how to make algebraic tricks to, to real world uh, applications. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that's the point. Quantum computing is smart application of tricks that shape wave functions or states of the quantum computer that you can measure something useful out of it. Pardon? Is it for the number of the quantum fundamental enough? What do you mean fundamental enough? I mean, because normally in mathematics or even in physics, if you do something tricks, you can solve certain problems with trick, but mm -hmm. if you want to have something applicable generally, you need to have a good fundamental thing that has wide properties. Yes, and a couple of algorithms I'm going to show later have very wide properties. So they are pretty applicable in many fields. So variational quantum ink solver is, a, is an application of a very of a interesting idea that has application in many fields. So uh, this is just, you know, a toy example from the uh, 80s, I believe, or even early 90s. So that was the beginning of the field. Now we know, we know how to do different uh, stuff with the, these computers. And uh, the, the algorithmic theory, of course, is way more developed. And there are hundreds of quantum algorithms, very tricky, that allow you to do very various things. And then you can combine them together to obtain some results, interesting results. And of course, the pinnacle of these algorithms is the short, short algorithm. So breaking our crypto systems that we use nowadays. So just before we go for lunch, um, let me mention that 
this algorithm can work not only for one dimensional function, but we can easily add register with the same. You see, I just added, added the register and uh, the first two registers are the same. Are the same. And it works if the function has uh, more inputs. So I will not go to the mathematical details, just to mention that, I mean, I'm a mathematician, I'd like when n is greater than two and it's, it's arbitrarily big. It works, at least on paper. And uh, well, in general, you can do it for n n. And it still works, it's so cool. So enjoy your lunch, or if there are any questions, uh, I'm here. First of all, yeah, questions? Yeah, well, I think I got a little bit lost here. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit like how the, you mentioned at some point that the quantum is time reversible. Uh, mm -hmm. And also they like the status of one qubit chain, the other one has to be changed as well. Okay, this, as for this. It relates to the like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. So the first, the first thing is about time reversibility. Yeah. When you had some classical gate, one of these first, when you have, you can move only from left to right. Yeah. It makes sense only this way. Mm -hmm. When you have this, you want to obtain this on the left. But in quantum, when you have quantum gate. It does make sense to go from left to right, but you can go the other way. Uh, what we, what because we, because there are simply rotation. You can rotate like this, but you can also rotate the other way. Yeah. Look. Uh, I understand that it can do that, but what benefit can this bring? Um, like if you can go backwards. Or... That's. You know, the benefit is only when you consider small complicated systems, and you can. There is one particular which which I know. So basically, if you have scratch registers, so for example, you can calculate something uh, something using additional qubits, then just retrieve a useful information from these qubits. So something you can calculate out of these qubits, and then reverse the changes you've made on your on these particular qubits in order to clean clean them up. So basically, disentangle from the others. So then you can use them once again, for example. So there is a way to preserve quantum memory use because of, of this feature. Okay. So it's, why is it interesting? It is because fundamentally it is something different. Okay, there is so-called so Landauer principle, which means that if you compute something classically, they, there will be heat generated always because you reduce entropy. So because quant classical gates, are reversible, so they you have four inputs, two outputs. You have to increase entropy somewhere because you are reducing entropy in your particular system, and entropy has to be cannot 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 be reduced. So there is a connection between classical computing and thermodynamics, very fundamental one, and classical non-reversible computing. So like we use now traditionally, has to produce heat fundamentally. That is a feature of uh, you know a connection between cal compute calculations and physical world. That's very interesting. And here, one of the features of quantum computing, which is not unique because classically you can also do reversible computation that is at least in theory doesn't have to emit any heat. But at least you know, the, the, but the, the quantum computation and reversible computation, the classical computation share this feature that you can reverse your uh, your computation, but in case of quantum, only before you measure. Because, because after you have measured, the quantum information is destroyed and you just have classical information. So maybe it's not very useful here for what we've seen here, that is the fact of the reversibility, but it's very fundamental and it's something to have in mind. That is also our limitation that we have as quantum software developers, that we cannot use any non-reversible uh, uh, oper computation because it is not allowed by the uh, rules of quantum mechanics. And 
if you assume that we can do that, then the, the, everything breaks in, in mathematics and we can travel faster than light and whatever, we can do whatever. So it's a very fundamental feature. That, that's basically it. And remember, this is calculation using the rules of the physics that are described by mathematics, of course, but physics is connected to our physical, our reality, our physical world. And that's crazy. That's amazing, in, in my opinion. So that's the reason why we are mentioning the reversibility of, uh, of, quantum, of uh, quantum computing. Yeah, it's an example of a quantum circuit. So on the register, you applied some gates. Yeah. So then you rotate the state in the, some way you, you designed. And this algorithm should do something useful that you want to, to do. And then finally you measure the output of this, of the, of this evolution and okay. you get some information about the system. And actually you have reversibility here because Hadamard is self-reversible. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm asking whether is that like based on the output that you wanted, or we can extract some actual information based on this tiny reversible feature. Extract uh, extra to like you know extra information like because of the feature that it can be time reverse. It's rather not a feature, it's a bug. It's a bug in reality. Because if you assume that uh, quantum, uh, like it's, uh, quantum mechanics is not reversible, and there are these kind of uh, mathem like mathematical investigations, then, for example, you can solve anti-hard problems efficiently. And we know that for sure. So this is a bug of our reality, actually, not a feature. We would like to be able to do non-reversible quantum computing. Because then we could we would be able to solve basically very hard computational problems very efficiently, but it's very unlikely. Yeah, no, I think I got a little <laughs> more connected than before. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
implementation of the algorithm we discussed before, Deutsch algorithm, for this particular function f of zero equals one, f of one equals zero, so not on a simulated quantum computer. This is a library Q-tip that allows you to simulate quantum computing on, on, on low level. That was the reason I chosen it. It's not really useful for like programming quantum computers, but uh, for playing with uh, with uh, simulated models, very good and doesn't really matter so much which of the libraries you use. The, 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 the structure is usually similar. So here on the, in the first line, we create a circuit, an object, it's Python obviously, that has two qubits and one bit. So we have two qubits in our register and we will measure one bit of information out of it and we just declare it here. And then we have subsequent steps of the algorithm. We apply negation gate on the first qubit because we want only first uh, uh, second, of course, because it is uh, enumerated from zero. So we apply X again on the second qubit, which in order to create the state zero one, get zero one. And then we applied Hadamard on the second qubit, Hadamard on the, on the first qubit, S not means square root of not that's the convention in this particular library they use for the Hadamard gate. I don't know why, but it doesn't matter. Then we have this C not gate, so control not gate with the second qubit as the source register, so the one that controls uh, the second qubit of the first one. I mean, you see that it's one zero basically. So those are pointers to the qubits. Then of course we have negation on the second qubit, Hadamard once again, and perform, we perform measurement in basis M0, so the measurement 0, 1, and with the, that is targeting the zeroth qubit or the first qubit, and the outcome of the measurement, so the one bit of information, this label from the measurement is stored in the, the only bit we have. Straightforward, I believe. It doesn't really need any more explanation. Or do, does it? Say forward. Yeah, questions? No. Okay, good. So now in our experiment, uh, because, okay, Python is high level language, which is generic, that is just extended with some libraries that allow you to uh, program quantum computers. You would like to have a low level, lower level language that is basically ex exactly driving, driving the, the quantum computer. So it's basically a low level code that is can be sent to various quantum computers. For example, you can imagine that you have a couple of them. Sorry. And this kind of um, language is uh, standardized nowadays. It is called OpenQASM. Now in version 3.0, doesn't matter so much. We have, here we have version 2.0, which is way simpler. And basically this uh, uh, QASM, uh, first of all, it can be executed on a quantum computer in a way, it could be just sent to IBM machine. Uh, second, in, it, can, uh, it is relatively easy to understand. So we have two declarations, one of the array of two qubits, Q rec Q of two. Then we have a declaration of array of one bit, C rec, classical register. And then of course we have this X gate, Hadamard, Hadamard, control negation, X gate, which means not Hadamard and measurement of the first qubit to first bit. I believe it is straightforward, but I wanted to show you that it's basically language that can be used to communicate with a particular device. Okay, so now we go to physics. It is the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> so, uh, because we want to run this program on the physical system, at the end of the day, we need to have the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> we cannot, what, what we were doing before, we were, we were just building uh, to this point that we want to create a Hamiltonian. A Hamiltonian means the differential equation that represents the behavior of the quantum system. 
So what does this equation mean? First of all, H hat in our case is just a matrix. Psi of T is just a vector. So state of our quantum register of many qubits in particular. So we say that a small change delta C of T over time delta T but of this uh, system is driven by Hamiltonian. So this matrix times di times of this system. Of course, on top of that, we have I and H bar. H bar is just physics stuff in quantum information. We don't care, or quantum computation, we don't care. It's usually one in our case. And I, okay, it's, uh, you know, how the uh, equation is designed. It was guessed guessed uh, by Schrodinger in a way, to mimic the behavior of the waves. So I basically in this kind of equation represents circularity. So basically cosine and sine, because solutions to these equations will, cost, will always have a lot of sines and cosines. So they will describe the wave-like behavior. Mathematically, the, Hermitian, the H, so the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator which means that it is its conjugation, it is itself. And uh, by the way, this H is not Hadamard. It is Hamiltonian in this case, in this particular way. So sorry, but that is, that is how it is in, in this field. Uh, so H is a Hermitian operator or Hermitian matrix, I should say in this case, because it's, it's simpler which means that it's self-conjugate. It also means that it has real eigenvalues. So it's a square matrix with real eigenvalues. So mathematically also it is important if you know about something about dynam linear dynamical systems, it can be di diagonalized uh, and it has, okay, yeah, if, you, if you care about linear dynamical systems, it has in a way trivial uh, Jordan form. Okay, but doesn't matter. It mattered, but okay. So that's the Schrodinger equation, and we want to go there from from our algorithm. So now uh, we, but okay, in our field, uh, a Schrodinger equation is not so um, difficult because we usually, okay, at least in this example, we will deal only with Hamiltonian that is independent of time, or at least in a piece of time, it is constant. So then the solution to Schrodinger's equation is given by a unitary matrix. What it means a solution? So coming from the differential equation to the exact, uh, to the direct equation that describes the, the change between time T0 and T1. So, a unitary, so the, the, the solution from, for the Hamiltonian between times T1 and T0 is just a unitary, a unitary that can be calculated using the, this formula on the bottom, this formula for the matrix exponent. So we have a Hamiltonian. If Hamiltonian doesn't change with time, we just take this Hamiltonian, find our delta T, multiply by i minus i, calculate the matrix exponent, which is this uh, series, and we have our unitary operation. That is how mathematics of these beasts work. Do you have a question here? Just a moment. Of yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. That's the point one. So just wanted to say, Okay, I am integrating this differential equation, which is Schrodinger equation. But this integration is just matrix exponentiation actually, because this system is uh, time independent in this particular example. And that's the, the, the level of simplicity I want to use here. If you work with dynamical systems, previously it is just a very simple example of a dynamical system. State space is defined by the wave function and the evolution by the Hamiltonian and the solution by the unit matrix.
And obviously, it is a system of equations, of differential equations, not just one, because those are matrix and matrices and vectors. Who doesn't, who has never seen any uh, differential equation in their life? So you know what the differential equation is. That's basically that. <laughs> Nothing really complicated. Okay, so now let me imagine a computer, a quantum computer. It's a silly one. It's just a spin chain. And, and of course it's a perfect one and it's a very simplistic view, but nevertheless, it's something we can, we can imagine and work with. What does this equation mean? It is a Hamiltonian that describes this, my, this, com this quantum computer. This Hamiltonian has two kinds of objects in it. Functions, real valued functions. Those are just functions that have real values numbers and operators or matrices. Here, this is a sigma X matrix, a Pauli matrix. Before we called them X, just, uh, the, just X matrix, but in, in this language is right, denoted as sigma X and sigma Z and this kind. So what does it mean, sigma x of zero? It is the rate of rotation around x of the first qubit, of the, of the zero qubit. And this rate is given by this function, how fast we rotate in, given, in a given time. And that's the, for the second qubit uh, around, uh, around the x-axis, for the first, uh, first qubit uh, zero, the z axis, etc., and this is coupling, which means the strength of the inter of the um, interaction between two qubits. And that's of course essential to be able to perform any two qubit gate because these Hamiltonians are local; they only act on a single qubit at a given time. They, they do not introduce any kind of entanglement of any kind of interaction or do not allow us to build a synod gate, for example. But here, this particular element that I want to be, I, I, will, I want to be able to switch off, on and off is, is describing the joint evolution of the systems and interaction of them. So now the question arises, how can I uh, compile the quantum code? So the, the series of quantum gates into the sequence of impulses that drives this system in a way that I expect. What is the se sequence of impulses? Just sequence of, just values of these functions in T. And I can do it. So here I use the grape algorithm, whatever it means. There's a particular algorithm that allows me to just calculate this, uh, the, quantum, the quantum gates and how they uh, behave. Just find these uh, controls from the, for particular quantum gates, actually. And uh, okay, it's relatively complicated, it doesn't matter, but I can just write a single function Python to get. As you can see, here I have a very relatively simple way of controlling the system, which is bang, bang. I turn on or turn off and give an interaction or uh, engage in reverse. Here you can see at hx0 of t, hx1 of t, z0, z1, and the coupling. So here you know, that it has something to do with CNOT because the coupling is turned on. And we call these pulses or driving of the system or control program, depending on the language. But those are pulses. And we can, you can access open pulse library in, from IBM and you can directly drive the quantum systems rather than using quantum gates. You can design your uh, sequences that manipulate the Hamiltonian of the IBM quantum machine, for example. I don't know it how to do it precisely, but that's the idea. 
That's the mathematical idea behind it. Questions, comments? Too fast, too slow, easy, difficult. Difficult? Why? What is difficult in that? Um, to understand how this relates to computer science. It is exactly the this assembler for this system. The assembler code I've shown, assuming that I have this particular Hamiltonian. So this imaginary quantum computer that I made up, that is a spin chain basically of uh, one half spins. And I use this black box, this grape algorithm to find out how this assembler can be mapped to this particular quantum computer. Assuming that I can only control uh, these functions H, uh, H of T and J of T. Better? <laughs> I wanted to show you that because you want, I wanted you to, I want you to have some feeling that, you know, we have these abstract ideas, but at the end of the day, there's a physical system behind it. Well, how I think about it, imagine that you are driving a robot. So we have a computer that controls a robot. So you are sending these control impulses to your robot that, and it does something. It is basically the same idea. But this robot is a quantum object. So we, and we have just only two rules that we can use. One is driving the Hamiltonian, so changing the Hamiltonian, and then measuring and getting some information from the robot. That's all. That's how we can think about it. And that was exactly this first picture that Ola has shown uh, with the quantum computer and classical computer interacting, interacting together. That is the one interaction. So just driving the quantum system directly. Good. So now I just wanted to mention the fact that we live in a very noisy world. And what we've seen up to now is just very ideal representation of quantum computing. This ability to construct cats and to apply Hamiltonia, uh, Hamiltonians to these cats and then perform measurements as it, the, it, they were described before is a very naive point of view. The physical systems, the actual quantum computers are way more difficult to deal with, but I'm not going to tell you too much about it because I can't. It, is, it requires a different approach, more knowledge, and it would not be very useful. But I, what I want to you to show is just some intuition about quantum noise. If you deal dealt with the communication, for example, you know that there are these bit flip channels and there are error correcting codes, for example. And you know that if you are sending bits of information, then can, they can be disturbed during the transmission and we have various ways of solving these problems classically, Shannon theory, encoding. We do it all the time. I mean, without that, uh, our telecommunication system would not work. We don't care about it because it is very, very efficiently dealt with on the uh, transmission layer, but actually it is a major problem. In case of uh, quantum states, we also have this notion of quantum channel, which let's say describes this noisy behavior of system. And here I just want to show a zoo of couple of uh, changes that can happen or how the channels affect the, the qubit. So here I have thousand random points selected on the log sphere. So thousand random quantum states. And I will keep this state. I will just use these states as a way to visualize how the information is in a way destroyed. So how non-unitary, non-reversible uh, 
evolution of a quantum system can be done. It is no longer rotation. It is, in general speaking, shrinkage. So as you can see, we have this value of uh, for here bit flip channel. So a channel that with some probability flips zero to one, and this probability here is set to 10%. And the visualization of this behavior, mathematical visualization is like that, with 20% like that, 30, 40, and 50. So as you can see, there are states at the edge of the block sphere that are unaffected. They are not changed. But most of the states ended up in the middle on the line between 0 plus 1, 0 minus 1. And those states in between, in the middle, uh, we call them more classical and the one that is exactly in the middle of the block ball. So the, the entire full, full ball is classical, maximally mixed classical state, something like a random coin. But that's mathematics, which is beyond what we can discuss here. There is additional, uh, we can have phase flip channels, so a channel that flips uh, phases rather than bits. So, it affects uh, like the the the, 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 the in, in, in this direction basically the this component of the of the quantum state, or we can have bit and phase flip channel at the same time, or we can okay that's one of the pure states and we can have damping channels so a channel that drives the systems towards zero so for example when one is encodes an excited state in some system so higher energy state and that's, that can spontaneously go to the lower energy state, like for example, electron in, a, in an atom. So that's basically the behavior of the electron in an atom that is, can with some probability go, can decay to zero. So that's this animation, pretty cool, I believe. So we start with pure states and then with probability one, three, what or fifty percent, seven percent? That's ninety percent. We go to this very small, like squeezed ball. So then, of course, we have very little information about the original state in the in the system. Okay, so just wanted to show that there are arrows, there are quantum channels. There is entire like additional layer of mathematics on top of that. What we've what from what we've learned today, but it is beyond this score. I mean, it's not possible to explain. This. But what is also important that we can deal with the quantum errors. So quantum computation is analog. We are applying real numbers and on the systems and this is basically like mechanical computation. It is analog process. But at the same time, the, the behavior of a quantum measurement is digital. We have labels, digital labels that we, as we've seen before. And by combining these two features, I mean, the analog feature, which isn't perfect, and in a way, probabilistic yet digital uh, measurements, we can reduce the amount of, um, uh, of errors in the quantum systems. This is done by error correct, quantum error correcting codes. This is the first one uh, invented by Peter Shore in the 90s. And this complicated circuit allows us to encode a single qubit of information on nine qubits in order to protect this information from a single error, single bit flip or phase flip efficiently. I don't want to go into details. This is very inefficient code. It's not something we, we ever use in practice. Uh, but this entire field of quantum error correction and designing noise resistant quantum computers. So these computers that can be error corrected and first tries of quantum, very simple quantum computers that can do that are already done, published this month, last month, I believe, uh, but they are not commercially available. So that's, Error, error correct, error, quantum error correction is not implemented in any of the currently um, accessible quantum computers. And these computers that are not error correct, quantum, that are not error corrected, these computers we call NISC, so near intermediate scale, scale quantum computers. 
And this, those are computers which are already constructed for, let's say, for 100 qubits that we cannot simulate efficiently using even our most powerful HPC, HPC systems. We can go up to 37, maybe 50 qubits to it today. Uh, and of course it grows exponentially. So 100 qubits is way beyond what we can do uh, on, on, the, on, the quantum, on the classical computers, but of course we don't know what it's used for or not. And that's the, basically the challenge of today to design such applications of quantum computers that can breach, that can exploit these 100 qubits, which are still noisy, very imperfect, full of errors, but maybe useful for something. And we don't know what yet. And one of the application is quantum machine learning. I will talk here about quantum neural networks. So one of the quantum machine learning methods, uh, which is a very elegant exploitation of so-called variational quantum computing, which I will explain you in a while. So, uh... Can you uh, talk a bit more about the noise? And uh, so before we have the, we have the perfect system, mm -hmm. how, how this uh, change to the added noise? What do you mean? I mean, the, 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 this is the equation we have, the, the physical system without the noise. Ah, you mean, how, what, what is the equation behind it? Yeah. It's a, oh. Generally speaking, the quantum channel, which is completely positive, turns to the real map. <laughs> <laughs> and I can give you a definition, then it's not very difficult. It's just linear. It's just a matrix, but it's a weird matrix, and uh, it's not easy. I mean, it's another way of equation. But if you want to go in a more precisely, usually we use some so called Lindlat equation, which is an equation that, in a way, okay. That I can explain in a way, but in, using an analogy, which is not, I believe, not very um, silly, I hope at least. Imagine that you have just a resonator, so a pendulum. Quantum computing is just rotations. So science and cosines. And imagine that we have a mechanical, uh, uh, a mathematical pendulum. Yep. So the typical, maybe that's not a good vector, perpendicular here. And if it's uh, not damped and there is no noise and, and it's just an ideal mathematical pendulum, of course, over time, the displacement will be a sinus so or cosine. Obviously, we know that. But if there is some damping, constant damping, there is a uh, usual exponential decay. So if we combine these two facts, we basically have a decaying cosine. And extension of this idea and a direct extension what I mean, you can use the mathematics I, you would use for the quantum computing to achieve the same result. But of course, the space is way larger, so it's way more complicated mathematically. But for the simplest case, you can achieve this effect. So oscillations, which are like perfect computation, because application of sinus of cosine is basically what we do uh, in this Hamiltonian. So that's, those are our unitaries. So unitaries means rotation. Cosine sine means also rotation, but this is damping. And this is what happens when you apply continuous quantum channel. So so-called Lindlat equation. So that's an analogy, but I believe it's relatively justified. And Lindlat equation is just a linear equation in higher dimensional space where the Hamiltonian and this Hamiltonian this Hamiltonian, uh, the Schrodinger equation is just an example. So just a simple example, I mean, simplest. at least unitary closed example of the, of the, of the Lindlad equation. 
where lambda equation is not the general evolution of quantum system. The most general is completely positive stress preserving one, so quantum channel. But that's the just language we use. Is it good? And the, the source of noise is uh, imperfect. Uh, everything. Or, uh, and everything. Imper I mean, you can have, okay. First of all, that's just an autonomous system. Then if you drive it, you have errors in your driving. So you have, you know, in the values you, 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 in which you push your quantum computer can be varied. And it is, it's a real effect we have to deal with. So just a random, not even noise, but imperfection. So it's a different kind of noise. So then you have coupling of your quantum system with the environment, which is, which could produce an entanglement between the system and the environment. Like in this exact example of two qubits, but then you don't have a uh, control over your environment. You don't know what is there. So basically, what you have to do is you have to assume that there is the most random stuff, the most random case, and this most random case tells us gives us mathematically basically this kind of solution if you do it in a continuous manner. So this is basically because there is okay as a picture because there are others, other pendula, pendulum or whatever, that ours is attached to some kind of interaction. That is like mathematical representation. We have others, other particles that are interacting with our particle, or our pendulum interacting with us. And of course, all these little pendulum, pendula or whatever, I don't know. Uh, are basically uh, acting in a random way or even constant, but uh, way on this, our, our pendulum and this decay happens. That's a mental picture. But properly speaking, there is entanglement between our system or our quantum computer and, and the, 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 the world, the rest of the world. And what we want to do is to separate the two, uh, the most uh, possible to, uh, to have the most pure states possible. Or we can purify the states by performing quantum error correction. Pure means not influenced by noise. Good. So this is a picture following from Xanadu. At least I'm giving credit to them. And they're producing a library called Penny Lane that you can really use to play with quantum machine learning ideas. And it's a very nice library, well designed. I, I like it a lot. You can connect it to PyTorch, for example. How? Exactly like that. <laughs> so imagine here that we have a black boxes, set of black boxes that are functions. These functions are, of course, uh, Vector, uh, they, 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 they operate on, on uh, vectors and there are vector values, valued, but all the values are real. There's no quant nothing quantum there, or at least from the high level scope, there is no, no, nothing quantum. So these, these functions are also parameterized. They have some parameters, real parameters, whatever they are. And of course, given the set of parameters theta, for a given data point x, we can observe a value f of x theta. Nothing complicated. If these functions are nonlinear, or I mean, not nonlinear, but at least there is some nonlinear here and there. If these functions are differentiable with regards to theta given x, then this is a neural network. Isn't it? A neural network can represent quite a lot of information stuff, basically. We can use it in various ways. So here, as you can see, this quantum node is a quantum computer that uses a unitary circuit parameterized by X and theta to calculate a value a real value function f of x theta. How calculate? I will show you later, next slides. What is important that recently, like uh, 2018, it was reported 
that for white class of quantum circuits and white class of these unitaries, which is useful, parameterized by theta, we can calculate the gradient of f of x uh, with regards to theta efficiently on a quantum computer. What I mean by efficiently is that we can generate, so if we want to calculate a single value of f of, f of x theta, we prepare the quantum circuit for a fixed x, for a x fixed theta. We run the circuit many times. We measure the value of this circuit. We take a real, real value functions, whatever, however it works. I mean, I will show you later. And we have the value f of x theta. It is not perfect because it is just estimated from many runs, but it's good enough. And then now, we, if you want to calculate the gradient, we, what we need to do is to just shift this theta by a, by a large value of s to the left and to the right. So add s or, and, or subtract s. And s is a, is a no, well-known number dependent on the, on, the, on the particular circuit. But it can be algorithmically efficiently found. It's very easy. And if we calculate the value of our function at point theta plus s and theta minus s and to just subtract it, we have the gradient. This is so-called parameter shift rule. And we hope, there was quite a lot of hope that it shows uh, us that we can do a uh, variation, another version about uh, uh, differentiable computation on quantum computers. What is important, this is not approximation. This is exact value of the gradient. Oh, 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 oh. Already, sorry. <laughs> That was unpredicted, but at least you can see there are more pictures there, animations and some fun stuff. Sorry, 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 sorry. Spoilers, spoilers, don't look at it. Uh, quantum annealing, animation. Ah, spoilers, 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 sorry guys. But at least you know that it's not going to be boring. Uh, yeah, we are almost there. Well, I'm almost there, yeah. Mm, okay. I I don't like this. Okay, so now how this circuit looks. This circuit will be divided into par two parts, conceptually, into one unitary that only depends on the value of, our, on, of the value of the function x, and the second unitary that depends on the theta. And we say that we have we can interchange these unitaries. It's our guess. It, we want to do it like that. It, there might be other ways to do it, but let's, let's, let's assume that we want to do it like that. So, and we can do it in a various ways. Therefore, u of k, u of one can be different from u of uh, two. And we have this u load, so loading data on the quantum computer. And you have u var variational parameters. So these parameters that we are going to change, which in case of machine learning is called just a model. So now we can imagine different ways of loading data to a quantum computer, but one particular I'm going to use here, which is not very efficient, but at least you can, you can easily understand it, is that I'm going to attach to each of the features of my data that I want to analyze using quantum computer, we, I, I'm going to just uh, attach a rotation on a single qubit along one of the axes, in this case, x. So depending on the value of my feature, I'm going to rotate my qubit in a different way. And each feature has a, every feature gets one qubit. Very inefficient, but straightforward. 20 features, 20 qubits, that's all. Of course, we can normalize the features so that, that we are in the, in the uh, range of zero to pi or two pi, whatever. We can, we can, we can play with it. it. Doesn't really matter so much, how much, so much how we do it. It's our choice. 
And then we can choose some kind of model, some kind of set of, uh, of gates uh, that are maybe entangling, because why not? This is a guess. That's the reason why I'm saying why not? And some gates that are we can represent, we can uh, eff uh, um, efficiently implement on a quantum computer. So this, for example, these rotations, any kind of rotation. That, there is no X, Y, or Z there because it doesn't matter. It can be any rotation. And this approach we call either a variational circuit on this, or in the, in the case of quantum neural network, actually a layer of a quantum neural network. Because that's really what reminds us from classical case of neural networks. Just a function with some parameters. Okay, last ingredient that we need to understand here is uh, is uh, how to build this function f of x of theta because we were not talking how to about the way we get real values from a quantum computer but here we have to use a notion of observable observable in uh, physics means that is something that is material in a way it is a position or momentum of a particle for example usually so it's a measurable uh, quantity that is a physical value feature of a given system. So that's the reason we use this term observable. What it means also that it is a real value. We don't have complex value physical features. We don't have physical uh, complex value momentum or position. We have just real value uh, position or momentum. And that's basically it. We are extending the, I mean extending, we're just applying this notion of observable as a particular case of a quantum measurement to have a real value function from our quantum system. Mathematically, observable is represented by a Hermitian operator, once again, Hermitian operator, like, like Hamiltonian. And what we are going to be interested in is, is only one feature, one, one, one function the expectation value of a given observable in a given state, which we write in this uh, funny way, like expectation value in statistics, expected value in statistics, but we have to indicate which state it is. Mathematically, like you can imagine that observable is just a measurement with labels, which are real values. So rather than measuring zero or one or plus I minus I like before, now I can measure energy of 3.5 or minus 16 or whatever. There's a real value that we obtain from the system for a given string of uh, mm, uh, string and for a given by basically or for okay, simplest way for a given projective operator or projective matrix like before. That's all it is. And all these projective matrices are squished together and in order to, to get uh, expectation value we multiply them by uh, by the uh, by this uh, by these uh, labels which are real values these energies for example and it averages out altogether and we are just interested in this expectation value that's basically it so mathematically what we do we take our observable that we choose we take our cat state if we for example simulate our calculations and we know what is cat state directly and we multiply it by on the right by cat, on the left on by bra. This is effectively an inner product given by O, because O is a emission matrix, so it defines an inner product or scalar product in a Euclidean space. Not Euclidean, because that's not what's going on, but yeah. Uh, so it, uh, the, 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 okay, if you just uh, represent this, uh, a scalar product and that's all we have a number and that's what mechanically what we what we need do you get it or is it uh, too complicated silence too much deeper, too much time. 
to many, to not enough time for thinking. Uh, uh, okay, that, long time and thinking. Yeah, okay, look. We have O, we choose O, whatever O means. It is just emission. It means that emission means that every, whatever vector psi we take, this, for, this, this form, blah, psi, O, cat, psi, will be a real value. That means that is exactly the same. And actually, what is important is that this O can be measured from a quick quantum system. So our goal is to prepare a state psi that depends on x and theta, then make this sandwich and get the value of a function, f. We have to stop here and have a discussion. Sure. <laughs> uh, Maybe more for this one? No, it is. It is the way. Okay, wait, wait. Maybe I can. I can. Uh, yeah, here. Look here. Uh, look that we have a, a function of theta. So x is omitted for a while. Okay. Which drop x. X doesn't matter. It's an output of a function. So we define our function that we which gradient we want to calculate as this expectation value of a given C state C that was evolved by a unitary depending on theta. So it's a new state, U theta times C is a new state. And we just calculate expectation value for the observable. I exactly use the language of physics here that you know, people in this theory use. Pardon? It's a vector. State is a vector, it's a column vector. O is a square Hermitian matrix. So this object here on the, on the bottom, this expectation value is a real number. That's all it is. It's just multiplication of a vector times matrix times vector. <laughs> That's all. Yes. Yes. Measure and uh, so you can also later on calculate your gradient in yes. real number by shots. Yeah. Introduce x again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the goal. So exactly that's the goal. The goal is to uh, once again find a way to encode our data on a quantum computer, use it for something useful and uh, get some information out of it. And in our case, in a way that is differentiable because we want to treat it as a quantum neural network, as a neural network. So it has to be real value and differentiable. That's it basically. I did not get what you. Like because, 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 because if you have first classical neural network, mm -hmm. you get, let's say, a matrix or a vector. Like you you get a vector. Let's okay. say you, you you have a feature vector. Yes. Feature vector. Yeah. And then you apply a matrix on this feature vector. Yeah. You so transform have, linearly, or yeah, linearly it is matrix actually. Using quantum computer, which has some nice quantum, the, which has some properties. You know, you do it in parallel. Okay, there are reasons why to do it, but I'm showing only you the mechanics how to do it. That's the mechanics how to do it. Mechanics is, you we have data point x, we transform x into a unitary circuit, then we apply it we apply a circuit that is parameterized by some thetas. 
in, a, in some way. Doesn't, I mean, it's a choice. It's a designer choice. Actually, we don't know how to do it efficiently. We, don't, we do know only to do it, how to do it in some cases. It's a model. It's our choice what kind of neural network we want to use. Then we say, in order to read out, to transform this circuit into real number, we use a notion of no observable, which is just a special case of measurement, which is real value. That's only what it means. And we average over these measurements. That's how we do it. Not optimized, even calculated, not even optimized. Yeah, that's hybrid quantum classical neural network with a quantum, some quantum nodes, like in, in, in this, whatever, bluish color. Bluish, bluish color. Technically speaking, this can be implemented as quantum computing instead of computer. Yep. That's why we call it quantum. Yep. That's the reason. Uh, it's not the only way we can use quantum computers for, for, quant from, for neural networks, but it is one of the ways. And particular one, which is relatively easy to understand. I understand that there is a lot of language behind it, but mathematics is just matrix vector multiplication, nothing else. So why is the hybrid um, needed here? That's um, because the quantum node is just able to uh, stimulate this gradient, but not able to do like pooling of um, other operations that talk to the mm. classic uh, neural network or why the hybrid is really needed? We don't know, you know, it's it's heuristic. We don't know why hybrid is needed. Maybe it's not. I I find particularly in my one of the examples, I did not use hybrid network. I used, I just made a PCA and then fed the data to a quantum uh, directly to the quantum neural network, for example. Why not? So you can, you know, it's like in machine learning, you have various ways of solving your problems. That's one of the tools. So, so that means in case you want to move back propagation yep. with the gradients, we can you can this. you can because you you know how to calculate the gradient. So you can perform back propagation. Actually, as far as I know, only two people have done it on an actual, I mean two, two groups have done it on an actual quantum computer because it's very costly to, to run. Nowadays, but in principle it's feasible. And the trick is that because our computers are noisy. We are just using very, a very little number of the gates and very short computation to do maybe something useful. So before our state is destroyed, we want to measure it and assume that it's relatively clean. So that's the idea. Any discussion, point of discussions? I mean, Bigger problems into very tiny pieces. Yeah, imagine that you are encoding not single feature per qubit, but you are basically taking these complex value vectors as your features. However, we can do it. I mean, it's not easy, but imagine that you can just do that. Then on eight qubits, you can have 20 to 256 features to the total power of eight features immediately. Maybe useful. We don't really know, <laughs> but as you can see, you can. So there, there was this estimation that if you would like to have, uh, for example, simulate the climate or the weather on the on the on the Earth, you need like fifty six qubits. Okay, we don't know how to encode the state of the of the weather on these fifty six qubits, and we don't really know how to read it out. But kind we kind of know how to simulate even even very complex processes on these qubits. So maybe that's a way to go. Uh, okay, that's not exactly quantum, not machine learning, but of the elements of machine learning can be also the uh, accompanied there. So imagine that with, uh, let's say 100 qubit quantum computer, you can simulate very densely, very dense grid uh, of, of, the, of the system of the weather uh, on the earth. 
Cool. Is it feasible? We don't know it. Well, seems that might not be might not be feasible. People are skeptical, but in principle, mathematically, it kind of works. There are some problems like loading data and unloading data, <laughs> which are two large problems. Uh, so loading data is uh, is a challenge, but there are some advancements and things that. We've shown recently, maybe not for the first time, but at least in the recent experiments that loading the uh, as observation data on the quantum computer in a particular way, processing the in particular way might be useful. We have kind of convincing proofs and it will be presented by GRSS. I'm skipping my, like, uh, too much forward. Okay, so here I just, I mean, it's complicated mathematics, you know, plenty of uh, great, uh, very tough, uh, symbols like this delta or f of theta plus s etc what i wanted to hear to say here that if we have this function real value function depending of theta because x doesn't matter here in this moment so which is like psi initial state usually zero unitary of or, or unit of psi depending on on the data actually unitary evolution depending on the theta and then calculating expectation value of that, then under reasonable assumptions, so basically for qubit rotations, let's say, just for qubit rotations, this is the exact formula, general formula for the gradient. So function at point theta shifted by s forward minus function of theta minus s backward, and theta depends on the particular uh, gate, so what gate it is actually, so what kind of rotation it is, and uh, and R is also basically R depends on the gate and S depends on the on the R on R. So for example, for this rotation R X, which is like can be described in like that, so minus theta minus times I times Pauli matrix sigma X divided by two, the exact values of gradient of this R is. Uh, one uh, over two and then uh, P over two, I believe it's fine, uh, is, is the shift. If you want to understand intuitively, it's relatively easy. Once again, because all these rotations are just sines and cosines. If you want to understand what is the shift of your sine cos, what's gradient, what is the change, you have a cosine. So you just measure this cosine in, fixed points and then you can three points or three po two points and you can fit a cosine uh, directly there so basically that's that's intuition behind this equation that's for well-known functions which are sinus sinus and cosinus sine, sine cosine you can you can you know exactly where to where, where to look at in order to have to calculate the gradient that's it that's it mathematical tree Okay, so here I just, you know, I'm diving into neural networks. Okay, who is completely clueless about neural networks? Okay, so you assume you know at least what is optimization, what is gradient descent. Here, we are just using gradient descent. Okay, the simplest form, you understand that what it is. We have theta at times t, so our model, at a given time, parameters of our model, and then we learn by changing the gradient. So we calculate the gradient of uh, f of theta over theta. We have a learning rate, eta, and we can uh, perform gradient descent and optimize. And of course, we can have nested of momentum optimizer or Adam or whatever. You, you, if you played with Python or whatever uh, library, you know that they, they exist and that's not really cool to talk about them very in very details. But here I want you to show, I want, you, I want to show you how it works in code. Okay, I hope it's right. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, that was fixed recently because there were changes in the library. That's how we can do in Penny Lane a very simple task. That's an example from Penny Lane. Imagine that uh, 
you are like me, so you are not a very clever mathematician, mathematically speaking, but you know how to code. And you, you have a state zero that you want to actually move to state, um, to state one, cat one. You don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it, but I can program. What is really described here, so we have two rotations, which are parameterized by phi one, phi two, and we have this uh, expectation value of sigma z operator at the end, which is basically because we want to minimize, so we're going to go to minus one, this expectation value, which is exactly, mathematically speaking, going to cat one. So we start in cat zero or wherever, actually, doesn't matter, we start wherever, and go to cat one. And that our goal is to find the, the parameters of these gates for phi one and phi two to do it. Okay, all oh, is a mathematician, she knows how to do it, I, I don't. So what we do, we, first of all, import penny lane as library we will use. Then we will uh, get in the send optimizer. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll import class for gradient descent. Then we will import NumPy from penny lane for some reasons, not from NumPy regularly, but it behaves in the almost the same way. And we create our quantum device by writing div dev equals QMA device, which is a default qubit with one wire, which means one qubit in this particular case. And we, this, we de declare our quantum node as in this large graph of uh, hybrid computation, which is a function that will be executed on device dev and has a following structure. It is a circuit function that takes a var, whatever, variables. In our case, two variables, zero and one. I mean, zero, one, those are just index, indexes, which, which where we apply Rx, rotation over X of var zero, rotation over Y, var one. And then we calculate, we return expectation value of Pauli Z operator, which is exactly what is on the pictures. So basically Pauli Z operator, maybe that's not, clear for you, but what it means, okay, mathematically now it's the, something I, I actually I forgot to tell you. So I hope I'm doing this right for zero. It has value one and for one, it has value minus one. It is now written in the language that all I was presenting to you. So projection over zero has a value at label of one, projection over one has a value of minus one. That's exactly measurement operators with the values, how it was in the previous lecture. So that's what ex exactly this expectation value of sigma z means. So those are two these projections with two values. Okay, so that's the reason why we are going down. So we are going towards minus one. So we want to go from zero to cat one. Okay, so now we have this circuit. We build our grade, we construct our gradient descent optimizer. So our, our optimization, uh, our learning alg algorithm with learning rate 0 0.25 here, eta. Then we create initial state chosen arbitrarily that requires grad. So those are our thetas we will, opt, or phi in this case, that we want to optimize over. And for first steps, we perform step of the optimization. If you played with our PyTorch, you see a very similar pattern here. Don't you? And, okay, so, and we print the value of the cost, but I don't going to print it, but I'm going to draw it. <laughs> so there are these nice drawings, which is blue arrow is the initial state given by these parameters 0 0.25, 0 0.2. So those are the initial rotations of phi one, phi two over cat zero. And then 
uh, this line describes the uh, uh, actually different strategies of optimization. So gradient descent, the, the, the basic one, the style of momentum and Adam optimizer for uh, 30 steps, 30 points on these curves. And you can see momentum on the nest of momentum, this curve, and Adam is even more crazy. So basically, you can see dynamics of the optimizer on this curve, which is very beautiful in my, my opinion. And as you can see, gradient descent is not so good because it doesn't touch the one, cat one, it's not very fast to converge. Only these a couple of these are fast. I mean, these two are only fast. Do you get it? And that's basically an application of variational quantum algorithm on the single qubit of this group only. But we, we've solved the problem of finding this value of these gates for these gates just by writing a program and optimizing it. So it's a differential computation scheme. It's not regular computing. I don't know how to do it by hand. Research question depending on the model, etc. I mean, obviously, the effects. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and you, you are not guaranteed to find the global minimum. There's no. Yeah, you, you, obviously, it is important, as in classical case. But I mean, uh, okay, maybe I have one question. Uh, where it is like, in comparison to classical state, to, to classical. Uh, more research needed. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I don't really know. There are the major, major problems here. You know, for, for example, generally speaking, gradient descent doesn't work, or these even these other methods. They don't work very well. We have a barren plateaus, so we have uh, vanishing gradients very quickly. So for many models, and especially these models I even I'm going to present you, we have vanishing gradients in higher dimensional spaces. Uh, but there are ways to fight with them. So there are you know particular guesses where people were able to show. That the gradient will, will, will not vanish, for example. So even it will be bounded from below. There, there are some theoretical results. So now, of course, you have to dig, dig deeply into quantum neural network into literature and look what people were, have found out in the last three years, basically. If you want to know exactly. And I don't, I'm not really a huge expert in that. I mean, I, I don't know many of the details. I just, just you know, learning as, uh, as I go. And trying to apply when I'm trying to apply these results. So now we are in the realm of machine learning, you know, and whatever works, it works. <laughs> you don't know why. <laughs> Neural networks, here we come. So those, this rigor, rigorous, rigor, rigor of mathematical rigor of quantum in computation is completely lost because those are heuristics. Uh, good. So I believe you now understand what is variational algorithm now. So now let me show you an experiment, of course, a tutorial, how to really make, implement a simple classification problem on a, using this concept. It will be amazing example of two moons, as you probably know. So the data set was later, but two moons, two classes, uh, and what we do with this data. So I have generated in SCAL scikit-learn two moons, and I will show the, later show you the code how, to, uh, how, how a particular classification procedure was performed. And there will be a, a nice animation for that. So what, we, what I want to do, first of all, I have some data from in the region of zero to one. So I want to shift them, of course, or, or like standardize them. And um, standardize them to, to the regions of zero to pi, obviously, because those are angles. Uh, then I will encode the data as rotations, as it before. So just rotations. So that's the reason from the why I'm using from zero to pi. Then I'm using this guess as my quantum neural network. Actually, there will be three layers rather than two. Uh, three, I don't, probably three, I don't, I don't remember anymore, I will see. Uh, it's a guess. I have some rotations and then some C nodes. It's how to choose it, entire new field starting. You can jump into 
actually that done with my colleague Mateusz from now also have a paper how to do it using uh, uh, reinforcement learning. <laughs> so it was done in Inkivitz actually, and now finished in Warsaw. So there is reinforcement learning, for example, to how to design it. We don't know, it's a guess. So I choose this kind of uh, architecture. Okay, now we have this gory function. This is exactly this expectation value, which is, okay, we have a function that is from our end, so from our feature space to R. In our case, R will be uh, bounded, okay, bounded by minus one, yeah, by the bounded by what, minus one, one. And now my f of x of theta is just expectation value of uh, uv theta times ue theta, so encoding and then variational on state zero. And my observable is just measurement of a single qubit, um, of a single qubit, the first one, because why not? That's the reason. And here you see mathematically how it, what it means. Exactly. This is exactly mathematically the, this function that I'm going to, to work with. Where variational is this, basically, and uh, encoding is this. And of course, I have classification function, which is just a sign. Plus one, one class minus one other class. Doesn't matter. That's it. Uh, so now, okay, this equation just says that my cost function is just average over expected, expected label, soft label against training label. That's it. And in, I do it in batches. And I start with uniformly distributed thetas on the zero to two pi. I hope that for machine learning people, it's pretty obvious. Just Cost is in training batches and it's average of each element of a batch. So Y minus Y uh, tilde, predicted value. Actual value was predicted value. Okay, source code. Imports. Uh, okay, I'm not going to talk about imports because yeah, okay, it's escalar and preprocessing, some metrics, iter tools, which is like, okay, so for batching, Penny lane, and basically that's it. Angle embedding and strong entangling layers, two last lines. Those are these two great gates that I had. The, the one that, that uh, takes the feature vector and goes as, uh, as data. And then I have strongly entangling layers, which is this model that just takes theta. Okay, that, those are just templates that I can use directly from uh, uh, penny lane. That's all. Okay, I make moons, generate data with random seed 42. Okay, not enough geeks here. Uh, that's amazing. Well, we should, you should be laughing at 42, okay. I just shuffle the data so that batches are not, okay, but why I, okay, I probably do it in batches. But nevertheless, I, uh, I scale the data, of course, to have to zero, zero pi region. And then okay, here, what is important, I build the classifier. So the classifier just takes the number of qubits. I create a date device, which couple of qubits here, actually two, because we have two features. I build, build this, uh, this circuit, which has angle embedding over X, and they have some weights, which are my parameters of my model and then measure a single qubit and that's my quantum circuit. I build my uh, cost function, which takes out my weights, my batch, my expectations value, all my expectations are labels, expected labels for the training set. I return my loss function, which is the, the just square of predicted versus, versus, versus expected and return the loss. So that's my cost function, very straightforward. And I have a helper function sign. Okay, that's, there's something wrong, but basically it's just classification, elementary. Then I decide to have three layers, why not? 
Then I encode the labels from zero to minus one and one to plus one, which, which is the same. Just, just to be consistent, I set the batch size for five. Uh, I calculate the number of batches. I choose the number of epochs. I create, okay, I, I'm going to prepare the random initial states, weights, titas. Okay, I, yeah, I, I, I prepare random titas, initial titas. Build my, build actually my nested momentum optimizer and in batches start to train my optimizer in a way doing stochastic gradient descent. Basically, that's it. Okay, this is like a little bit complicated, but though this is just going over batches, nothing else. And of course, my theta are being changed all the time. This is what I, opti uh, those are my values and fact uh, function which I optimize is batch cost, which is this lambda here. I can, I, I will leave it here for a while, but if you you can read the code, it's uh, pretty straightforward. I know that there's quite a lot of like stars here, but it doesn't really matter so much. It is just over batches, build my batch cost function, which is this cost here, perform optimization step. Like in Penny Lane, uh, like in uh, PyTorch. And then we convert the scores into uh, the results. So basically the predictions and they cal calculate prediction values. That's all. So now there's a nice animation that shows uh, what's going on. I, this is what, okay, so it's slightly over, okay, this, this feature one, it's written feature one, it doesn't matter. So I have two, these two data sets, blue one, red one. I have my landscape of my values of my fa classification function, soft classification. So from minus one to one, but actually here I just see part of the range and I'm going to optimize it. As you can see, the accuracy rises. And after 15, 15 steps, 20 steps, okay. 20 steps, we are at the accuracy level of 89. And our model adapted to the data relatively well. Okay, it's not expressive enough to fit to perfectly to the two moons data set, but that, that's the problems of the Wapnik dimension or whatever. Uh, so that's, uh, of course, this model is not sufficient enough to, to do that. But that's the problem of this particular model, not generally speaking, of course, it, uh, with, with, quantum, with quantum machine learning and quantum neural networks. So this animation shows you how quantum machine can learn. As you can see, it is pretty relatively simple. There's quite a lot of language behind that, but it is relatively simple. And here we stop. What is the uh, timing? Uh, hola, you know? Yeah, so that's the perfect uh, moment to have a discussion, don't you, isn't it? <laughs> um, so actually the question is, okay, no, that, the, the, the question is because next we have half hour and then we have two hours or what, how much time? One hour. Okay, what do you prefer? Do you prefer to learn about quantum annealing or do you want to prefer about but to prefer to see basically a slideshow of, re of results, what can be done for S observation with quantum machine learning. And I can go to quantum annealing relatively quickly and show you one example, which I believe is pretty, pretty neat, but just didactic, which is related to hyperspectral images in some way. Or we can go, hmm. Results, maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can show you what people have done, what, what we've done. Uh, there is, uh, 
but it will be mostly slideshow in the sense that you will be just, you know, or, or overview. Okay, let me allow me to maybe spend next half an hour on quantum annealing, and I can try to squeeze this uh, rest of the slideshow because that's slideshow. In uh, uh, yeah, maybe let's divide it twenty forty. I will try to do it divide twenty forty. So quantum annealing will be pretty fast, and then uh, I will go to to uh, to examples. Do you have questions now regarding this, for example? Are you completely lost? Are you so completely lost that you don't even hear or listen to me? <laughs> yeah, I, I believe that some people are completely lost. Like, it's hard to grasp what, what is nice. I'm telling you about the mechanics of that. I mean, for me, it's amazing. I can have a quantum computer that does machine learning for me. I mean, hey, quantum AI, what more, more buzzwords do you need? <laughs> I don't, I'm not saying you, telling you that it is efficient. I mean, there are some indications that it might be in, efficient here and there, effective, but we don't know. We need more research. So we need more people that will dive into that and spend some time digging through the literature that already exists, learning this stuff and trying experiments. Fortunately, there are tools that you can use. Uh, personally, I, I love the part that uh, makes it possible to think quantum uh, mechanics. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, the, those uh, layers that you have that you uh, learned. I didn't understand where they came from. Uh, so basically, this. Did yeah. that? Yeah. There are synods and there are some rotations. Isn't it beautiful? That that's basically an argument here. <laughs> there are some rotations and there are there are some synods. That's the argument. That's. Uh, we don't know. We call it Ansatze on German. So a guess. We guess it. We don't know how to really design this sequence efficiently for many cases, just for few. Because we believe that quantum entanglement might be useful, so we entangle this, uh, these qubits together. And because we need to adapt, some, change something, so we have these rotations here. And these rotations are parameterized, and we don't really know what they are. So it's a little bit like in neural networks. It's in our sense that we are just using a different mechanics of these neural networks. There is also the show based on simulation. This is, of course, of course, of course, just a simulation of a perfect system. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. You can plug an imperfect system, of course, you can do it. You can plug any wave machine. Just as a question, how do you uh, define your device here? That's the only difference. Of course, this is a simulation. You, you, know, you need so many shots on the quantum device now to, to, to run it that it's really very difficult to execute uh, properly. Or even our tra training is even worse. It's inference okay. that you find. But uh, training is very inefficient. You need so many calls, and each call is very costly. <laughs> Obviously, it's just a beginning. So, uh, you know, of course, you know, there's this plenty of hype with quantum, you know, these beautiful pictures of devices in very cold system. Yeah, that's beautiful. But the, 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 the mechanics of it is relatively easy. And that's what we can do, basically, with that. And sorry, you know, I would like to see something, you know, way better. I would like to have. 2000 uh, pure qubits, but you know, this, uh, these engineers and, uh, and physicists are unable to provide me with, <laughs> with such a machine. But, you know, IBM is claiming that they are going towards one million qubits. Okay, IBM is claiming it doesn't mean much, but nevertheless, they are claiming that. So, 
then you know what how to design the circuits for one million qubits so you can you, you, you could in principle upload many samples of the data have very large circuits that could be designed in such a way so with million qubits so you have quite a lot of parameters for that and you, of course these computers are pretty slow i don't remember what's the exact time of computing but in case of d-wave it's uh, up to two seconds per shot i believe so yeah so two second yeah two seconds for sure something like second for sure so one cycle useful cycle of calling this function is one to one second about you you need to differentiate to cal to calculate the gradient over let's say thousand parameters doesn't make any sense now obviously but it's it's neat this idea is really needed that you can encode your data on a quantum device and perform some useful calculation really this uh, this is a very simple animation of course but this animation is like it's cute in a way <laughs> and i know it's uh, not very very useful yet that's not the point i have a question sure thank you oh, uh, you are very strict about the coffee and that's good <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's let's stop. No, we can we can we can have coffee. <laughs> yeah, okay, we are late. <laughs> sit down, sit down, class. <laughs> okay, uh, so we decided, and it was a, it is a royal we, um, so that I will talk about quantum annealing for like maybe 20 minutes, maybe even less, and then switch to applications. And I don't really remember what I had there, but at least we'll, I will show you what can be done with quantum version algorithms. Quantum annealing, it's a very different uh, way of thinking from what we've done now. Quantum annealing is a particular procedure, very limited in scope, that is, in this particular scenario, not equivalent to quantum gate model. It is just a subset. It is a different way of thinking. And if you are programming D-Wave machine, because that's the only quantum annealer that exists, you have to think in a particular way, which is not what we've learned until now. You have to think in the uh, language of Ising model which is not very difficult, but it's a little bit unusual. So what is an Ising model? This is a function, which is real value and operates on strings of minus ones and ones. So it is a function that accepts strings of minus ones and ones and spits out a real value. This function is quadratic and has linear term and a quadratic term. It is parameterized by weights hi, which are real values, real value, and jij's, which are also real, real value, real valued. Sorry for accent. And if we have this kind of Hamiltonian, this kind of function, our generally speaking, our goal is to find, okay, there's an error here, which is a minor one, minimal string that minimizes this Hamiltonian. Of course, that should be, that should be arg mean rather than mean. But we want to find minimal energy or minimal value of this function or the string that minimizes it. That's the mindset, that's our, and that's code. What you see here is code. So D-Wave basically what does, it takes HIs and JIJs. You choose your HIs, you choose your JIJs, you send them to D-Wave, you get some string, which is not minimum, but some lo low value of S, of this H of S, and that's it. That's D-Wave in the natural. Why is it important? It is important 
because many MP problems, difficult problems, can be encoded in such a way. And there is a very nice paper, uh, which is not really showing up here, sorry. Or maybe it will be on the next page. Uh, who's, uh, which uh, paper, you see the, 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 the table of contents of this paper. And that is, you can see, many problems in computer science can be encoded as in the form of, the Hamilton, of this Ising Hamiltonian. Difficult problems and useful problems. If you had some course on algorithmic theory, you know some of these problems, like graph partitioning, how to divide graph, particular graph into two parts, how to find clicks in graphs, important in machine learning, for example. Um, exact cover, so that's also, uh, so those are uh, covering problems of in, in graphs. Um, okay, exact cover, I don't even know what it is. Vertex cover is basically you want to color the graph. Uh, uh, the knapsack problem, you probably, maybe you heard about. So those are optimization, discrete optimization problems which are usually, uh, which are usable, that there, is, there are use cases for them, and they are difficult to solve using classical methods. And one hope was to use quantum computers to solve, this, uh, solve these problems. And here you have the, 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 the paper is Ising formulation of many NP problems, or Ising Frontiers in Physics 2014, Andrew Lucas. It's a very nice review. If you want to dive into the wave, read it. It's just basic level, the beginning level, because it's even more complicated to use the wave than that. But you can learn quite a lot from this paper. It's very well written. Uh, Hamiltonian cycles and past problems. So typical graph problems can be tackled, attacked with quant with D wave. I, I, I'm not using the word solved because it is not true. <laughs> Okay, how D-Wave works. Very simple explanation of how D-Wave works. It changes your, I mean, you, you, you have your Hamiltonian problem. So this collection of HIs and JIJs, and I will show you in a moment what it, HIs and JIJs are mean uh, visually. There is a visual, there will be visual representation. It changes them in a Hamiltonian problem. So now we are dealing with a quantum Hamiltonian. That is a quantum Hamiltonian that is implemented by the D-wave. What it means? It means that uh, for particular HIs and JIJs, which are our parameters, we can try to obtain, drive this, the, this, this, this quantum system into the state that minimizes the energy of this system. What it means, it is that, the, okay, uh, that's complicated in a way, but okay, this is a Hamiltonian. So if it's a Hamiltonian, it is a Hermitian matrix. If it's a Hermitian matrix, it has real eigenvalues. If it has, has real eigenvalues, there is a minimal eigenvalue or at least a couple of them. So there is a subset, a substate, subspace of quantum states. Oh, let's simplify it. A single quantum state that minimizes this Hamiltonian. And this single quantum state, when measured in the up-down axis, should provide us the solution to our classical Hamiltonian, which is difficult to solve usually on a, on a classical computer. How it is being done, it is by setting up the quantum system in a very simple manner uh, that every single C spins points to one direction. So for example here, and it's in superposition, zero plus one or zero minus one. This is a simple thing to do in a quantum computer, in the wave computer. They know how to do it efficiently. And then, and that this, this state relates to the minimum energy 
of this Hamiltonian. Very simple one without quadratic terms. So without any interactions. And now we switch slowly, we go from the initial Hamiltonian to our problem Hamiltonian, this one, that should contain the solution or should be related to the solution of our problem. And this change has to be done slowly in theory. How slowly? Okay, that's not really important. If we do it slowly, it's fine. We probability of staying on the lower energy level, lowest energy level. So the probability of finding the best solution is constant, is, uh, constant in theory. I mean, it's very high in theory when we go very slowly. When we switch from the easy Hamiltonian, initial Hamiltonian to the problem Hamiltonian. If we go fast, our probability, I made a mistake in my code, sorry guys. It's, uh, uh, it's then it should go away. Sorry, there's a mistake here. Basically, the story is if we go too fast, we cannot solve our problem. We cannot solve NP hard problems with quantum computers, but maybe in some cases we, we can be better than in classical case. That's the story. The problem with, with D-Wave is that, oh, that's a slightly older D-Wave, is that it has limited number of connections. So these vertices are rep represent HIs, so these linear terms. Edges represent the couplings, so these JIJs. And this is very limiting because we, can, we cannot do any function, implement any function directly on the way we have to limit ourselves to the functions that are embeddable in this graph. Okay, I want to show you a particular example. I have still five minutes. Maybe it's very simplistic that I done with a couple of friends and my former place in its span on hyperspectral image post-processing classification. So I have uh, Indian Pines, who knows Indian Pines? Uh, that's your subject, <laughs> not mine. Uh, okay, yeah. So I have Indian pines. I just take a very small part of Indian pines, so hyperspectral image, and I am going to classify this image using traditional classifier, SVM, and then post process the results of the classification using D wave. Okay, I'm skipping part of it because that's not very important. This is what is important. I, because I work with qubits, I'm using one versus all classification scheme, which means that I'm just dealing with two classes at a given time. And I have a classifier. I trained a classifier, SVM, on a hyperspectral image. Boring stuff. We know how to do it. So I have classes of pixels. I know whether a pixel with some probability belongs to a given class or not. And I have, I know that the pixels are neighboring each other. So they are neighbors. And it is very likely that two neighboring pictures are similar, uh, pixels are similar. Okay, that's an assumption. So now I would like to agree these two kinds of information, these two pieces of information. I have a class of my pixel, or believe what is a class of my pixel, and I have information that this pixel belongs to a particular community. So I'm writing, so I'm transferring the probability of classification from SVM, this PI of C, into HI, energy, how much I press my qubit to be up or down. If it belongs to the class, I go up. If it doesn't belong, I, go, I push it down. And then I choose a parameter beta, which is jij, but this constant, so I can, uh, for the entire pictures, pictures I can just uh, just uh, just uh, just use it as uh, external parameter, like a single parameter, 
which is how my peers, so pixel around me, push me to belong to a given class. That's a story. And they, then I anneal. So I basically want to agree these two kinds of information using this Ising model. And you, we can observe that visually. Let's focus on the left pane only, left panel. So we have four different cl uh, classes here taken from uh, Indian pines. So I have, well, I don't know which one, it doesn't matter. Access means grant true, so pixels that are using for training. SVM, it is just a result from, uh, from the SVM. So what is the cl uh, classification probability that it obtained, obtained from SVM? Red belongs to class, blue does not belong to, 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 to the class. And the annealer column means what is, so I, I in a way, encoded this, uh, this information on the Ising model, send it to the annealer, sample it from the annealer, assuming that I have a given peer pressure, so beta parameter. And given this beta parameter, uh, I obtain new classification labels. I mean, updated in a way. And because there are errors and the samples are all different, can be different, as you can see, there are some white dots. So I sample from D-Wave Anila, and this is visually representing the noisiness of D-Wave Anila. So not only you can see the effects of the easing model on the grid, which is somehow connected to magnetism, if you are into physics and to uh, classical easing model on the, on the grid, but also you can see the noisiness of the, of the annealer. You are looking at almost exactly the samples uh, drawn from the annealer. Okay, there is embedding problem, but I don't want to go into details here. And then you can observe when I rise the beta parameter, you can observe that peer pressure is getting larger and larger. So look here, very small peer pressure, larger, larger, and even larger. So that's very, you know, very hard. And of course, I mean, it doesn't work very well. But nevertheless, you can see that uh, it kind of works. So it behaves in an expected manner that peer pressure has an influence over, uh, over pixels. And it can be used as post-processing. And those people that know about Markov random fields and conditional random fields can see that it's basically that but in a very simplified manner presented here. What is nice, it is visual. It is almost exactly data from the wave annealer applied in the, uh, for uh, land use classification as a post-processing in a very naive way. I was learning this stuff only. That's the reason why it's not published. Uh, but yeah, it's not completely silly. That's it. I don't, I'm not claiming it's super. It's not, doesn't, doesn't work very well. I'm not claiming it's better than classical, not at all. It is just a play, but you can see the effects of the annular. So we have probability of belonging to a class as a local energy, so HI and coupling, which is constant, which is peer pressure. Okay, and just last point, that was old annular. We have now Zephyr topology, which is new annular, new annular. Uh, better qubits, small qubits, and you can do quite nice stuff with that. And maybe we had some ideas how to use it for as observations, but that were never implemented. <laughs> but uh, there are some couple of ideas you can you can do with this new topology, and new annealer, and better qubits, and more qubits, etc. Uh, yeah. So that was, uh, and I wanted to stress: we don't know whether V wave is effectively useful. We know that it is quantum. Okay, there are some very strong experimental indicators that it behaves in a quantum way when you use it in a regime in which you, for which you as users or we as users have no access to. So for very short time, amounts of time, D-Wave behaves as a quantum device. But unfortunately, you need long times to observe to have higher adiabatic uh, computation. So being able to solve at least partially hard problems. MP, let's say hard, no, not MP hard, because I don't want to deal with the details, but hard computational problems. 
So maybe in some future, but it is fun to play with, learn it. And there is an arms race again uh, in, in optimization of Ising Cuba models. It's the same, basically the same stuff uh, that, uh, that is being done. And now you can anneal, for example, on Azure or AWS, you can anneal your uh, Cuba models or Ising models. Uh, on classical devices or on classical accelerators and etc. So it's a way of uh, thinking that is useful and that you can uh, you can use for your problems. Is it exactly useful right now? I don't know. More research is needed. <laughs> but it's a language of computation, new language of computation that is based in very old physics, of course, statistical physics, but it is being it resurfaced yeah, as a new idea because of D-Wave mainly. Applications. Okay, here we have, yeah, should be fine. Sure. So the idea is that you define the eight. H-I? H-I. And J-I-J, yes. Yes, and, and then you, you wait for some time to sample the- No. What's the... Uh, the problem is that the, the oh this is the idea let's say here you start with all the qubits pointing there it's easy and then you start to in to couple these qubits slowly and the same point pushing them up or down and that's exactly what is what is on this graph which is maybe not very clear but that's what happens here we start here all qubits there and then they are you know, aligning up or down slowly. If it's done very slow, we know for sure, like mathematically, you will solve your problem. But sometimes it is very, 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 very slow, which is not feasible. And so if you start in the lowest energy state of your easy problem, so pointing there, each eventually, and then they start to agree with each other and have some pressure from the from above or below, then they will go to a state that is, has low energy. So it's very, very good for us. But at the same time, and they, it, the state that encodes the solution of our classic uh, Hamiltonian problem. And how do you know when you Sorry? So they, they arrive at state and they stay there? And you measure them. And you measure up or down. Okay. And that's a, and then you have obtained a classical string of binary binary values, which are useful for which are at least approximate solution or ideally the exact solution of your classical Hamiltonian problem. Uh, that's the idea. There is noise, doesn't work very well. There is coupling problems, there are errors. You can have see entire documentation of the wave and papers on this subject, 20 years of research. <laughs> it's not easy, but that's the main idea. Yeah, so that was uh, this and embedding problem, minor embeddings, yeah. Hybrid annulars, hybrid sampling. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of things to talk, talk about, but not, not enough time. <laughs> okay, so here I just want to recall the variational algorithms once again, maybe very quickly just to show you what can be done. Once again, because that's an overview. Okay, that's just a nice picture from a paper you can see at the bottom that quantum computers and classical computers should work together. Fine. Applications. Uh, so basically here in the nutshell, there is this idea of uh, what was that was already presented in a way in the uh, in the in, as a quantum neural network, but here is just a quantum eigen solver. A quantum eigen solver is basically the same problem what that we had with the uh, with the with the D wave and easing. We want to find low energy or low value of a Hamiltonian, and that's it. <laughs> what is this? What is low value of a Hamiltonian? Sometimes it's a difficult task. And how we do it, we have a circuit with, that has some parameters and we build this energy function here, which we already know. 
which is just expectation value of HQ in state C theta. And we vary classically the parameters theta and calculate low energy. So we find such parameters theta that minimize this, or at least are close to the minimum of this, uh, uh, of this function, energy function. That's the idea. And it can be applied in the various ways. Uh, okay, I don't want to go into QAOA uh, and uh, cut a couple of other ideas. Okay, so basically, just to tell you, there is a way to calculate a similar, to, to use a, a gate-based quantum computer in a very similar manner as the D-wave annular. This algorithm is called quantum adiabatic optimization algorithm. And it is in a way, uh, in a way, basically using the same idea, but on a quantum computer, proper quantum computer gate-based other than, than just at the annular. Here, uh, I mean, this is here what we see. Okay, the question, the, the, the point here is slightly more general than, than, uh, than what we've seen in the classical Hamiltonian case. Here, look at the HQ. HQ is not a classical Hamiltonian. It is a quantum Hamiltonian. What it means, it is not a, a diagonal uh, matrix because in case of D-wave, actually we deal with diagonal matrices, but it is a general Hermitian matrix. And this general Hermitian matrix can, for example, encode uh, as information about the state of a molecule. But because of some algebraic tricks, we can always transform this problem actually to a problem that is a combination of classical Hamiltonians in a way. So, okay, that requires to talking about the fact that uh, Hermitian operators have a real value to Euclidean basis and this all stuff in uh, matrix analysis, but it's not so very important. What is important that it is, you should know that basically we have couple of uh, a, a, combi a, a combination of classical Hamiltonians that, we, that can encode, uh, can be used to calculate low energy values of a quantum Hamiltonian, proper quantum Hamiltonian. And we can do it on proper, proper quantum computer relatively efficiently. How we do it? By using variational circuits. And here is an example that might be very, I mean, I'm not expert in that. So here, this is chemistry. So what, what is interesting here, that we have a fermionic Hamiltonian, whatever it means, it is, uh, Hamiltonian that people do care about in chemistry. I don't, <laughs> and I don't know much about it, but there is a Hamiltonian with that consists of creation, so-called creation annihilation operators beyond my pay grade. Okay, I know a little bit about it, but it doesn't matter. So basically whether a particle is here or here, creation means moving a particle from one place to another, and that's it. So electrons, for example, can be on different places, etc. But there is the clever people know how to create, transform that this kind of Hamiltonian into a Hamiltonian that we can deal with. And for example, you can see a Hamiltonian in the fourth bullet point, this A for hydrogen. So imagine that you have a molecule of hydrogen. And this alkyl of hydrogen, depending on the distance between the atoms, can have different 
uh, attraction the repulsion shape. Energy. So if the atoms are close, they attract. If they are far, far away, they, they, okay, they are close, they repulse, they are very far away, they attract, etc. So there is a, basically, there's energy landscape of this molecule. So this Hamiltonian, as you can see, has, uh, okay, actually only sigma z parameters. So it's classical in this particular case and identities. And these coefficients f0, f1, etc., can be derived from the fermionic Hamiltonian in some way, which I don't really know. And there are parami parameters. What happens is that we can, just what we can do, we can take this Hamiltonian, apply variational principle, and try to calculate what is the landscape of the energy or how, what is the minimal energy of this Hamiltonian uh, using just a variational circuit. A, I mean, a, some kind of guest variational circuit. And here you can see plot for a circuit that has no entanglement power. So in our guess, in our ansatz, we don't have any entanglers. So no C nodes, for example. Then we have one entangler, two entanglers, some more C nodes. And you, we can observe the exact energy. So in the inset, you have um, the solution that was obtained from a quantum simulated computer, still, but using this variational principle. And here you have how quickly this, uh, this models, various models, uh, achieved very close, uh, solution very close to the minimal energy, which of course we know because it's a very small problem. And uh, so the inset, uh, so that's for, the, for this minimal value here. So here we see basically optimization procedure, how it goes. So that's basically the, the idea that might be useful even for, for earth science, for geoscientists, that we can infer some information about uh, quantum um, mechanical systems like these uh, molecules using quantum computers. How would you apply this in your field of research? I have no idea. I, I don't really know much about it. But the exact, this, this is basically almost like quantum machine learning, but without data. We have just parameters, that's all. Okay, there is this uh, idea. Maybe I, yeah, I think I skip it which is quantum adiabatic optimization algorithm. Mm, do I have any pictures? Mm, yeah. Okay, you can basically use the same variational principle to solve uh, cubo problems. That's it. Here, it is applied just to max cut problem. Okay, I will talk about max cut problem and that the fact that it can be solved with that. If you want more, more we can discuss it later a little bit. So look, imagine that you have a graph of, and you, you have connections between the graphs, of course, I mean the edges, and you want to uh, cut the graph in such a way that you cross the maximum possible value of uh, edges. So basically, we want to color the graph. Mm. Two into two distinct parts, red and blue. And basically, there is a way to, to encode this problem onto quantum Hamiltonian, or classical Hamiltonian, actually. Minimize it either using D-wave or using quantum antibiotic optimization algorithm. And we can divide, uh, we can find this solution relatively quickly using, for example, IBM device. And there are some examples of that. Uh, yeah, so, and here you can observe probabilities obtaining results which are actually proper. So this string 0, 1, 0, and the 1, 0, 1, 0, these strings are negated. So basically it's the same labeling up to just switching of one to zeros. 
and there are proper max scatter solution to this uh, problem. But that's all I wanted to say because we were now getting to our observations and what people have done and we have 25 means, maybe it's, uh, I will see whether it's enough, enough or not. Uh, okay, once again, here is the work I've done. I believe that, yeah, I've done using virtual quantum circuit, the one you already know. We've taken the data from Sentinel-2 global land cover classification problem project that was funded by European Space Agency. It is a small patch of land in, in Poland somewhere, selected by people from uh, as observation department division at the Polish Space Research Center of Polish Academy of Sciences. I'm not an expert in those observations by no means, but they've chosen the land in such a way that uh, the labels are varying and it's not uh, trivial to, to classify it. So that was two years ago, um, almost three years ago, when we done this small project, we've taken this data. Even we are not, I'm not going to show you your, even any other pictures because uh, even at the time, the the libraries I was using were very slow, and I was able to process just very limited number of pixels. So even performing inference on simulation of this image would not be possible efficiently. And the, the, the project was relatively simple. So basically, the data from Sentinel were encoded as rotations, as I already presented to you. We use this kind of uh, maximally entangling layers, three of them, I believe, in our project, and uh, done the same work as before. So basically, yeah, we, uh, we added some biases here. So actually, the only difference here is that we have additional value of B, which is a classical bias, which was also used in this classification. There's a small, slow problem that it's not Classification function is outside of mine, zone. it doesn't matter. Uh, so we, we, we have very simple idea. We have a very simple model, but we, we use the data from actual Sentinel. And uh, this is the, the, those are the results. And I use the approach one versus, uh, I don't remember. One versus one, yeah, one versus one classification in case of, so, so because there is a multiple labels, of course, multiple, yeah, multiple labels. So it is uh, not only two classes, but multiple classes. So therefore there has to be a way to choose, I mean, to, to combine single qubit classification because I was just performing, we were performing very simple binary classification. Unfortunately, the uh, overall classification accuracy is very low due to the fact that the uh, algorithm that is implemented in scikit-learn that was used for this, uh, for combining the binary classification results was very poor. And it was not adapted to this particular problem. That was the main issue we had. But actually, as you can see, just a simple, I believe that was projecting, uh, we just taken uh, Sentinel data projected to four, four values through PCA, the traditional PCA, and then just put it into, uh, encoded on this uh, three layer quantum neural network and perform some statistical analysis that very elementary. We were able to achieve pretty good classification accuracy, uh, accuracy scores. As you can see, from seventy percent to hundred percent, is it good or not? It depends, but it is uh, comparable to what you can do on the classical device. Obviously, that was uh, very elementary, without any errors, even simulated. So that's just simulation of ex uh, of uh, very like accurate quantum computers. What we've learned from this project is that actually you don't have to uh, uh, optimize multiple epochs, Sing single epoch is sufficient enough. 
that was something we learned that is in this particular scheme, a single epoch was good enough to, the, the maximum was already written in a single epoch of training. And this project evolved into a project we have in, with uh, ISA, with, uh, with Barton Lesseau, my postdoc, Manish Gupta. Uh, also, we have like weak uh, cooperation with Sidral Company in Poland. With Tadeusz Kotzman, uh, Marcin Pawłowski, who is uh, uh, who is quantum scientist and one of the IRP unit in Gdańsk, Łukasz, which, which is my former PhD student, now professor at it, it in my former unit and Space Research Center. So I was very happy to 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 to, uh, to use this research as to kickstart this particular project. And this project is providing first results. So the first results we've we're able to uh, like obtain very, very also initial, but nevertheless seems to be useful. There was the question whether we can apply a, a framework that was presented in this relatively complicated paper, Power of Data in Quantum Machine Learning, uh, that uh, whether we can use this framework to, for the, Sentinel-2 data and whether it's going to be useful or not. Okay, first of all, in order to discuss this, uh, this paper in at least a little bit, and the framework they, the, 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 the authors introduced, we have to talk about projective quantum kernel, which is not easy just unfortunately. But the idea is here. Idea is that we don't uh, use quantum neural networks. At all. Idea is that we use only classical classifiers, but we use quantum computers to generate feature vectors that we then classify um, classically. And there are some strong indications in this paper, not uh, simulations, but mathematical rigor, uh, uh, rigorous uh, deliberations that show that there exist data for which a particular transformation that is, can be implemented on a quantum computer, feature transformation, can be advantageous for a particular distribution of the data. And that is proven. So this is a technique that can show you the power actually of quantum computing as just transformation tool for your data. So the idea is here. So the idea is here that we have these uh, data points, A, B, etc., C. And of course there are distances between these data points. And then you, encode the, this data on a quantum computer in a particular way. I will show you later how it was done here. There are many ways, but the, that's the, basically the framework they provide. They encode the data on the quantum computer. So basically you do this parameterized quantum circuit that does something with the data. And then you measure your, your data points so basically you retrieve some information from the quantum computer. You create new feature vectors and that's it. And then you classify those feature vectors classically. So this is loading, measuring, no parameter fitting because that's not really part of the experiment. And of course you have just to guess your embedding. So in a nutshell, it is basically that. So look at this uh, V of theta uh, function or V of theta uh, unitary. It's a unitary operator that is composed on this interaction X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z mm, with some parameters theta. Mm. And then and these parameters theta depend only on data points. So this is basically a function that transforms 
This creates a unitary, which is highly entangling our, uh, our quantum state, but this unitary um, depends on the data only. And in particular way we do it is that, uh, I mean, it was also done in the original paper, we just replicate the results for particular data, so that's all we do. But uh, we, you start with the zero vector, you apply rock, local random rotations on your zero vector, just random, randomly chosen, doesn't matter so what it is so much. Then you apply this strange evolution that is driven by your data. So your quantum system is just driven by your data. You obtain a quantum state and you measure single qubits. So you, you measure first qubit in, in, and you measure X, Y, and Z. So you ask different questions about this qubit. You, you obtain expectation value of this X, Y, and Z. And those are three features you, 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 you obtain. Then you go with the second qubit, next three features, etc. And these features uh, are just a feature vectors of your data. It's a representation of your data, which in some cases can be shown that are way better for classification. And here we show just traditional neural network, typical two layer network perceptron that is used to classify the transformed uh, data. And we use the, either the original data, so Sentinel data projected onto four-dimensional space, or we use our projected data that are encoded in quantum states, then measured in this weird way, and then classified. And we can obtain, obt uh, and this is for one particular subset of the data from the set I, I've shown you before, for thousand points, and we perform classification. And as you can see, classification, uh, even accuracy for the quantum to, to the transfer data, uh, transfer in the quantum way, is not even so much for training, but it's way better for validation data. The clue here is that the labels we, cho we are choosing are artificially chosen to be the best for the quantum case in a particular way. So it, it's, we are cheating here. We are not using labels which are uh, true land cover classes. We are using labels which we artificially uh, added to our data set in such a particular way that the distance between this classification jump from quantum to cla from classical to quantum is maximum from in some sense that's pretty complicated so i want didn't don't want to show the mathematics behind that uh, x uh, epochs sorry that those is the, those those are just training uh, uh, training accuracy and train uh, and validation accuracy values for perceptron that's Classical stuff. But that's a good question, of course, it should be included here. This is just you know the convergence of the perceptron how of the of the neural network. So it seems, and we for most of the data sets, we, we we've tested this idea on a couple of data of subsets of the data. So basically of on thousands of points, I mean subset consisting of thousands of points of uh, from particular classes, so it's relatively rigorous, you know, for paid paper, so do not expect too much. Uh, but we've obtained, we've obtained this result uh, in most cases. So at least we can say there is hope that this particular transformation of the Sentinel data might be useful for some classification, not we are not claiming that it is used for land cover classification because the, the, the true grant true labels were not used. We're not, were not even touched. We generated our label, the labels ourselves in a very particular manner according to a, a particular algorithm that is related to this particular method. 
yeah, they are artificial. They, they, they maximize the separation between classical and, uh, and quantum models. That is the, the only reason for this label. So it's an experiment. It's not a solution. By no means it is a solution, but it is just an experiment that says, okay, there is hope. Modify in a way that maximizes something that, that I mean, that yeah, probably. But you know, this entire framework that uh, in the paper I was showing up, showing you the power of latent quantum machine learning is basically prepared for exactly for that. So, for maximizing the separation and not schematic, it is not, it is just experimental framework and some the girls proof. Proof. So now, you know, the question is how to go from this experiment to something useful. I don't know yet. It's not very difficult in the sense that mathematics behind it is not extremely difficult, but it takes time to understand what they've done. It's long paper. It's, it uses results from many fields of uh, machine learning and, 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 and quantum computing and classical, uh, classical, um, Computer science. So yeah, there there is work way way forward, but we have to spend some time on it. So you can modify the kernel in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the this yeah, we can we can modify the kernel, and we can so there's classical kernel we compare with, which is obtained through SVM. So of course it is not the the most rigorous and uh, most rigorous uh, procedure, but nevertheless. It's not completely random. It's not just you know single experiment that worked, and we everything else was just not uh, not hyperparameters were not optimized. Et hyperparameters were optimized, particularly, but of course we show that you know we in very good. I mean, there is some hope. That's basically what we can say as a result. There is some hope. Let's dig in. It. There is you know we can vary many parameters here and there to see to see whether it will work or not. Okay, so here I just uh, recall a couple of papers that, was, that were already mentioned, and those are results that were obtained by others. Here is the paper that uh, Beton Rousseau was involved in. And what they do is, okay, basically, it is a hybrid quantum neural network, quantum, uh, quantum neural network that is, as you can see, relatively traditional, a part of this fact that there is a quantum circuit in between. And they have, or they obtain very good results, 97% of something, like it works. So we have convolutional layers, we have uh, a flattened layer, of course, fully connected, a quantum circuit similar to ours and the fully connected and so on. Like very straightforward thing but they were able to implement it and show that it kind of works. And uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it can be useful. There is a very old paper actually, I mean, very old in this <laughs> area. In 2017, some people used uh, quantum annealer uh, to do some boosting. So basically they had multiple classifiers and they were looking for trees and uh, they used the quantum annealer for boosting. Um, of a collection of the classifiers. Um, yeah, and basically that's it. And I believe these people were not even in, in, in the field, are not so much in the field anymore. I don't know. And there is this very uh, important paper by yeah, Sozo, for people that know him, <laughs> and Mihai Datko. Uh, Sozo is a, a PhD student of Mihai, and Sozo published very, a lot of papers on this subject. Uh, I believe now he's the, the go-to person to that you should look into if you want to learn more about quantum computing and and, uh, and various applications for various areas of Earth observation. And here they have three results, basically in this uh, paper, their own results. One is for subset uh, selecting uh, subsets of uh, uh, bands for classification. 
and they show they use Kubo for that. So they encode the, the problem in Kubo and uh, select what was the best for what subset of bands is the best for the classification in hyperspectral image, of course, of uh, Indian pines. Uh, okay, whether it works, I mean, they, they claim it works. I mean, the results are positive. I'm skeptical about the wave, but you can look for yourself, basically. The second experiment was to use, uh, I don't remember what, I mean, those, those were uh, quantum classifiers that were implemented on the uh, on wave 2. And they obtained very good results on, on, on the wave. And the third one, I don't really remember, but as you can see, the confusion matrices are very nice. Uh, but that was also for, uh, I don't remember exactly what was done there, sorry. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so that's basically a sh my, my short uh, summary of what can be done, what I believe can be done, but I should, I'm not uh, definitely an oracle here, just, you know, that's what I see to do, what that we can do. So single pixel uh, classification using granular or gate model based quantum computers, classification of patches that we done a little bit about work on the subject but it's not i mean it's not ready yet random macro random fields uh, based classification post-processing and maybe you know jointly and maybe some more complicated macro random fields maybe with some global interactions there were some ideas that with some ideas with uh, what we call chancellor that we could basically not use just local macro random fields but macro random fields that have very long range interactions so basically maybe implement so logic on uh, annealers. So basically, for example, you can say that there are additional logical rules that uh, allow you to not only see that neighboring pixels should be similar, but also that, for example, if there is a particular set of global meta uh, super pixels, for example, labels for super pixels, it is very likely on a given piece of land or not, or piece of, piece of image or not. That's something that could be done, for, I believe, very pretty efficiently on, uh, on, the, on the Zephyr architecture, because there are three layers. And you can one layer could then implement the data, the second, the local logic, and the uh, two layers, additional two layers, basically, for global logic. Because the data, local logic could be done on the one layer, and two layers of Zephyr could be used for global features. Global, global logic in a way. And of course, we can see that classifiers ensemble boosting, uh, ensemble boosting seems to work on D-Wave. I mean, not more research needed comparison with proper annealers, traditional annealing techniques has to be done, but that's something to look into. Okay, so there are some questions about the future. You know, one question is what we can do with thousand nose, noise qubits. How large annealers, imagine like million qubit annealer, how could it be? Could be employed to, to our problem. So, what can we do with hundred or thousand error corrected qubits? That's a challenge to even have imagination what we can do with that. Yeah. So, how to um, uh, upload the data? We don't really know. I mean, in my case, spectral data, but of course, uh, any other remote sensing data. And the question is also interesting whether you know. We can find a killer app in remote sensing that could drive the design, the physical design of a quantum computer, one particular. So just, you know, whether we can say, okay, look guys, we want to have, we have this particular application, which is really amazing. We know that the particular uh, physical architecture of the quantum computer that is there, that uh, would be very helpful. And then we can say, we want that and IBM, please sell us thousands of these quantum computers, for example with this particular architecture. That's something we can also think about. Yeah, and there's quite a lot of papers, which I don't want to show you anymore because we are running out of time last minute. So there are contacts to us. I'm happy to talk to you. You can look at my webpage. You can look at all our webpage, uh, all our webpage and uh, it's my Twitter, okay, whatever, my LinkedIn. You can contact me if you wish. Yeah. Maybe you are interested in this program.
There, there will be some push in this for, for sure. There will be some money, some postdoc positions, some PhD positions, surely in relatively quick, short time. I believe. But to dive into this field, you need to know machine learning, some elements of quantum computing, generally be skillful in mathematics, and of course, know about as observations. Obviously, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> You're dead already. I mean, I'm active. I was talking all the time and got up at seven o'clock in the morning, which is not usual time for me. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot for this long journey. Thank you for the invitation. Very interesting. Yeah, the future is here, more or less. Um, the, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, I genuinely believe in this uh, application. Whether it's going to be useful, we don't know. No, nobody knows. Yeah, we need more people. That's why we're organizing all these cool yeah. events. So maybe, you know. Stimulate your interest <laughs> to maybe dig into the field. Yeah, talk to the friends, talk, talk to, to your friend, uh, younger colleagues, you know, the students you have around you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Sell the enthusiasm we have to this area, to this area of research. You know, be our salesman outside of this room, basically. <laughs> Saleswoman, sorry for being sexist. This is the idea. Yes. So, so, four days we managed to so arrive to the end and <laughs> we survived. I just want to say thanks to all of you. For being here to came to iceland you know to, to be part of us i hope you know this is not just a goodbye but you know we can still keep in touch you know we have our, all the contests you know all the emails are there all the slides are uploaded almost so yeah enjoy the rest of your trip here in iceland i will send you a survey probably tomorrow so you can you know, sleep on it first <laughs> And you can, of course, uh, give us all the possible feedbacks, you know, be critical also, you know, we would like to improve if there is need to improve the next summer school. And um, yeah, thanks a lot again and goodbye. Of course, we should thank Gabriel for organizing all this, <laughs> all this stuff. It was a huge enable for sure. And the university for hosting this event because amazing place never been to iceland never had an opportunity to go here most likely because of other reasons so thank you gabriel and thank you university whoever is in charge <laughs> <laughs> yeah good university good. <laughs> okay thanks yeah. thank you thank you